Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us this morning. This is module three, working with diverse learners. Um, this group is group C and our third round of presentations for our teachers um, distance learning training series. Uh, we will be presenting information today and we'll have a follow up question and answer session on August 10th, I believe. Um, for any questions or support you may need, um, that you can let us know on August. You actually can put in the Q&A that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit, and then we'll address them at um, the August 10th um, showing or session. So before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that your microphones are on mute. Um, you'll only see the presenters in view. There are others that are, are online with us, but you won't be able to see them on your screen. You will only be able to see the presenters here on the screen. Um, if you haven't already, I believe uh, Tamara put on the chat to log in, um, type in your name, your grade, your position, your school and email address on the chat box, okay? If you need to ask any questions while the present presentation is going on, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Um, we're asking that you put all questions in your Q&A box there, and any other discussions can happen on the chat box. And that chat box is where you're also logging in your name and your information that we're asking for for this session. Uh, yes, this session will be recorded and it will be sent, the link will be sent to your principal and shared uh, to be shared with you later. Um, last, there will be an evaluation link that will be posted on the chat at the end of this session. And we ask that you pretty please take that evaluation uh, so we can get the feedback from you guys on the sessions that you're, you're on the information that you're gonna hear today, okay? So before we actually begin uh, our presentation on working with diverse learners, we wanna show you this sh short video and this video is coming from our deputy, Joe Sanchez and the curriculum and instruction division. And it basically, I'm trying to bring it up here. It basically talks about, um, gives you information on the three modes of learning or the three models of learning and lesson planning. So without further ado, I'm going to show you the short uh, video. Day. And welcome to our Wednesday module training. My name is Al Garrido from the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. And I'd like to acknowledge all the good people here at CNI who helped put all of these trainings together. They include all our amazing instructional coaches. Let me get the audio on. Sorry. Let me get the audio on. All the learners who took their time out to get this. Day. And welcome to our Wednesday module training. My name is Al Garrido from the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. And I'd like to acknowledge all the good people here at CNI who helped put all of these trainings together. They include all our amazing instructional coaches, our project leads, Michelle Camacho, Eloise Sanchez, and Joshua Blas, and of course, our beloved Deputy Superintendent, Joe Sanchez. I'd like to acknowledge all the learners who took their time out to get this training during your summer break, especially. What you've learned so far includes module one, Microsoft apps, where you were introduced to the basics of Microsoft with our focus on Microsoft Word. This was a key application that we felt would be wisely used during all three of our models of learning. Module two, in our Google Classroom training, Learners had a chance to see one of our basic LMS platforms, which is familiar with many of our teachers and is one of the most used platforms around the nation. Just to recap real quick, our models of learning. By now, everybody should have learned about the three models of learning. They are home learning, online instruction, face-to-face, -face, and home learning hard copy instruction. 
those are the three models. All three were referenced by Deputy Sanchez in a screencast that is available for your reference on the GDOE YouTube page. But the key, the key points of the models of learning are as follows. First off, number one, the models are a culmination of ideas that are being globally discussed, and our models are not unusual to many other districts. We are all defining the new norm together as a nation and as a planet. The second point, GDO teachers, you are not alone. You have a support system, not just with us at GDOE headquarters, but also amongst your colleagues and amongst teachers within your same subject area. Collaboration already exists in GDOE, and you will have support all around. Number three, a growth mindset is necessary as we continue. We will not have a perfect situation. Take your time and do not rush. Feel free to spend the first or week or two weeks helping your students adjust. Recognize setbacks and practice. Practice with your students how to adjust. Give practice homework and troubleshoot situations that may cause issues. How they turn in assignments, how they communicate with you. All of those may be issues in the beginning. Take your time. Don't worry so much about getting straight into content. Those are three key things about these three models of learning that you should keep in mind. As far as our key points and lesson plan designs, we want you to number one, keep them parent and student friendly. As you write your lessons, remember that many of your lessons will be taken home. We need to provide parents the type of support they will need in order to work in partnership with us. Explain your content is number two. Don't assume parents will know the content or even know why the content is being taught. Give them clear instructions and provide background knowledge. Number three, engage your learners during your lessons by giving them step-by-step -step instructions, provide clear office hours for after, and ways to communicate with you if they need support, and implement strategies for your diverse learners, such as FED, ESL, and GATE students. Now remember, the modules we're giving you are basic training tools to help you in the classroom. Some may be experienced in the content that we're teaching, and some of you may not. Take notes and feel free to reference any resources that are made available. Now, introducing module three, diverse learners. They will be, you will be learning in this module how to identify the characteristics of exceptional learners, learning challenges of the exceptional learner, basic accommodations, and how to assist exceptional learners in the three different learning modules. We hope you enjoy our next module, and I'll hand you off to them now. Thank you, and have a great day. Okay, so that was our um, a short message from um, Joe Sanchez in the Curriculum and Instruction Department on the three modes of models of learning and lesson planning. Um, your principal should also have um, another video that Joe Sanchez with the same message uh, that they can share with you later on if you wanted to see that. In addition, that video will also be a part of our um, Zoom meeting uh, recording here, so you can also review it at that time too. Um, let me get back to our screen. Okay, so the purpose of this module um, for the advanced participants here today, if uh, you have that um, background in we're working with diverse learners, this may be refresher information for you. However, please take advantage of this presentation as, as a thought to how you may want to share the information or the strategies with your parents or your students as you plan for the three models of learning. But the purpose of this module is to give you that basic information for, um, for special education, English as a second language, and gifted and talented education to help support lesson planning for the three models of learning. Our objectives for today will be, um, by the end of this session, you will be able to identify characteristics of diverse learners. You'll be able to identify the challenges of diverse learners. You acquire some strategies to support diverse learners, and you identify considerations to support diverse learners with the three models of learning. Um, you'll be 
taking in a lot. That's a lot of objectives you'll be taking in today. Um, and But however, please keep in mind that uh, the instructional coaches, including myself, would be out um, at the school sites to support with support you with any of this information um, that you're going to be getting today and to help you to plan as you open up your school year and you move along. So we're going to begin with special education and here to present to you uh, today for special education would be myself. My name is Debbie Shimizu. I'm an instructional coach. I also have Ron Gogo, who is also an instructional coach with me, Christine Hernandez, who's an instructional coach also with, the, with um, curriculum and instruction division, and Noreen Guzman. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm, we're going to pause for a minute real quick because they're going to adjust the PowerPoint presentation for us. One moment. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to begin with our presentation on special education. And here to present to you the first part of special education is Ron Gogo. Good morning, everyone. Um, so to begin our presentation with special education, we wanted to start with governance. Um, some things to know is that um, we're not speaking on behalf of special education. Okay, so we're, um, although we're presenting the information uh, under special education, we uh, wanted to acknowledge first governance. Um, as you know, uh, anything related to uh, special education falls under IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And so this federal law governs um, how services are delivered. Um, it governs services uh, and also um, it ensures FAPE and parent participation. So FAPE is uh, free and appropriate public education. And then of course, it also ensures parent participation. So special education is a specially designed instruction at no cost to the parents and it's designed to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. So there are 13 labeling disabilities that fall under um, IDEA and special education. However, we're, for the purposes of this, of this session, we're gonna be focusing on three of them. And these, these three are the um, largest amount of, there are, a large number of students uh, within the Department of Education that are receiving uh, special education under these labeling categories. And they are autism, other health impairment, and specific learning disability. So for the purposes of this presentation, from here on out, if I remember, um, specific learning disability is also commonly known as students with SLD. So this is a um, this is a chart. Uh, this information was pulled on December first of two thousand nineteen, um, and so we uh, the first thing that I wanted to point out in regards to uh, the number of students um, under each category is that this these numbers will be slightly different, maybe not too much, but they'll definitely be different. As you know, we're um, starting a new school year. 
And so because this information was taken in December, between December and August, there, there are uh, students um, receiving special education and related services that may have graduated. They may have transferred off island. Um, and if they met the ultimate goal of special education, they may no longer uh, need special education and related services. So these numbers will drop. Um, but we wanted to focus on these three primarily because there is a good chance that there's going to be one or more of these students in your, in your roster, your class roster. So we take a look at the numbers. We have 241 students who are list, uh, receiving services uh, as students with autism. There are 212 students who are receiving services under the category of other health impairment. And then um, there are 1,013 students who are receiving special education and related services under the category of specific learning disability or SLD. So uh, beginning with our largest number uh, of 1,013, we wanted to take a look at uh, what is a, a specific learning disability or SLD? So a specific learning disability is a disorder of one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding spoken or written language that impacts the student's ability to speak, read, write, spell, and do math calculations. Under this term, this term also includes um, three medical um, categories, which is dyslexia, dysgraphia, and developmental aphasia. And I'll go into what those are on the next slide. Um, please note that this term does not include learning problems that are primarily a result of another disability, be it visual, hearing, or motor, um, as those students may not have any um, psychological deficits. So here are some common characteristics of a student with a specific learning disability. Students with SLD um, make consistent consistent reading and spelling errors, and if you remember the if you remember the definition that I just gave, that they have uh, deficits in processing spoken and written language. So it just kind of flows right in that naturally these students will have um, learning deficits with reading spelling. Um, they also make common errors, and um, I'm going to show you an example of a student with a specific learning disabilities work submission and work sample so that we can see that via this definition or via these characteristics that they do manifest into their day-to-day -day work. So students with specific learning disabilities, um, they make common reading and spelling errors. They also have um, reversals um, or they make um, letter formation slightly different. They struggle with writing within a defined space. They, they reverse letters. For ex a common example would be the word is dog, but it starts, but the student uh, begins the word D-O-G with the word, with the letter B. Um, so that would be a reversal. Um, there's inversions. Um, and this is basically when a student forms the letter opposite. So instead of writing the letter M, they will instead use the letter W. So that would be an inversion. And then there's transpositions. It's words with this containing the same letters, uh, but the student will indicate um, instead of, for example, the word left, L-E-F-T, they may, in, they may uh, write down the word felt, F-E-L-T. And so it has the same letters. Clearly, these words mean different things, but that would be an, an example of a transposition. And then, of course, um, the final one would be substitutions. And that is words that mean the same thing, but they, they instead use um, 
So an example would be home, home and house. Technically, they, they mean the same place, but in the sentence, the student will use the word house instead of the word home. And then of course, there would be grammar issues in their, in their sentence structure. So here are the common types of um, SLD. There's dyslexia. And dyslexia is basically when a person has difficulty um, processing letters and sounds. Uh, for example, bat, the word bat, b, at. Um, it's hard to, to make those, those letter sounds or write those letter formations. There's dyscalculia, dyscalculia and a, a learner who has deficits being dys, dyscalculic, they have issues with, um, you know, the natural number graphs, the quanti uh, quali uh, quantifying numbers, and then, of course, learning procedural number facts. So we're going to see issues with their, their um, computation in, in math problems. And then finally, There's dysgraphia, and dysgraphia is um, a writing disability where a person, um, where we see it, uh, the manifestation of dys dysgraphia with, of course, those letter formations and writing within a defined space. So this is um, an activity that, uh, you know, we'll just spend uh, a minute on. Um, we've decided to use it, and I'm almost certain, let's see, how many participants do we have? We have 100. Okay, so oh, also I wanted to mention that uh, the participants in this, in this session, um, they go across the grade level. So we do have um, teacher participants in elementary, middle, and high. Um, so, hi. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is a letter, uh, an, an activity rather, that I'm, I'm almost certain 95% of you have already engaged in. And the reason we've, we've decided to go ahead and utilize it, if in the event it was, never, um, it was never presented to you appropriately, it actually shows the challenges between the left and right brain. And so if you take a look at the words, the word yellow is, uh, the, the text is colored purple. And so, in this activity, we're going to ask you to, instead of reading the word, to say the letter. So for example, on row one, column one, the word is yellow, but the correct response that we want is purple. So I'm gonna give you um, 20, 30 seconds to just um, say the color and not read the word. But the issue here, the, the challenge here rather, is for you to do it as fluently and as, as quickly as possible, okay? So remember that we're, the activity, we're asking you to say the word, or say the color and not the word. You can begin. So if, if for those of you who did engage in the activity, and we know who you are, and I'm just kidding, we don't know who you are. Um, so for those of you who um, did engage in the activity, what you should have felt, and this is what I felt when, um, maybe not so much now, because this is probably like my thousandth time that I've um, participated in this activity, but what you should have um, sort of seen is the struggle between the left and right brain, where one side wants to read the word, which is what's, what comes naturally, and the other hemisphere of the brain challenges that natural will to read the word because we need the correct response is the color. So there should have been some sort of disconnect and it, it should have been um, a challenge for you to as quickly and as fluently say the color and not the word. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what a student with a specific learning disability, those are the challenges of the processing. 
So here is another activity. And I'm pretty sure, again, most of you have seen it. But the reason we continue to utilize it, first and foremost, is this is a, wor a student work sample of one of our very own, a student um, from GDOE. And so shout out to the teacher who gave this assignment. Um, essentially what it is, what the assignment was, was the teacher gave them a writing prompt and then the students were supposed to write their response. So we take a look at this, at the student's work sample you're gonna notice that clearly already we see dysgraphia. We already see that they're the student, um, the manifestation of, of their disability, it, it, it challenges them to form these letters. And this is a high school student, by the way. Um, so it was challenging for the student to form the letters and it, in some areas of this, assi of this assignment submission, we're seeing that there were also challenges with writing these words within the defined space. You'll also notice some reversals of letters. Um, so really uh, this, what the student wrote was B when what they, what they should have written or what they should have formed on, this, on their response is the letter D. Um, so we see that based on the, the common characteristics of a student with a specific learning disability, we're seeing that here on this activity. So for the benefit of those and myself, um, so the teacher collected the um, assignment and then asked the student to read his um, or her assignment submission back to the teacher. And this is what, and the teacher jotted down verbatim what the student said so I'm going to read, read this for you. Um, I suspect that the child with a learning disability must frequently experience an Alice in Wonderland existence. Often we find that he must cope with an unstable world, inconsistent adults, and haphazard perceptions. He's confused by the crazy symbols we give him, pressured by the length of time to do it, and frustrated by his repeated failures. He does not learn the traditional way, and so we must teach him differently. So although if you take a look that clearly from this assignment submission, we're not getting the essence of what the student um, wanted or intended to say. He did say it. It just you know, would have been a struggle for the teacher to get capture the essence of the students of the students um response right and so if we take a look at this response we're going to see that there was an amazing amount of thought that went into his writing his writing uh response and submission and this actually shows that our students um with specific learning and actually any student with a disability that one they can learn and two if we provide them the access and the opportunity and the accommodations they can also flourish and so with this particular example we're seeing that there is a large amount of thought that went behind um, the assignment submission and clearly you know for for some for some students this particular student he was able to also express his frustrations with his learning disability so what are some accommodations? I, I mentioned that in the previous slide. And so um, again, uh, the first thing that I would like for you uh, all to know is that accommodations are just, are just supports that are given to the student. It's almost like leveling the playing field. It's taking a look at what are their challenges, what are their deficits, and providing supports um, so that the student can, can then uh, complete the lesson assignment or engage in the learning. Um, and what was I going to say? Um, accommodations do not um, change the expectation of what is what what the teacher wants the student to learn, or what or what the objectives are. It simply just provides support so that the student can access um, that learning, that level of learning, and also participate and engage in the learning. So here are some accommodations. And um, 
what I would like to do with the accommodations that we've listed is think about the three learning models, right? We have the face-to-face, -face, we have the home, um, the home learning hard copy and the home learning online. And so can we still provide accommodations to students that we're not going to see on a regular basis? And the, the answer is absolutely. You know, with the, with, the, with the new technology that we have access to, gone are the days of having to buy a tape recorder and, and ensuring that the parent has a tape recorder um, to utilize at home. Most, most families um, have um, smartphones. And so you can definitely send an audio message or a voice recording via the telephone. Um, provide large print. That's a, a simple solution is just increase the font size. Uh, for those of you who attended module one, um, the, pre the presenters um, of module one, they did show how you can increase um, the font size. Reduce the number of items per page. You take a look at what, what it is um, that, you know, what the objectives are. And if you're giving your typical student 20, um, 20 items to answer, you can give your, your student with a disability 10 or maybe five. And if we remember the student submission, there is frustration that our students with specific learning disabilities that they that they that they have to deal with and that they're challenged with and so you know one of the things is to alleviate the the frustration is to reduce the number of of items that you would like the student to answer you can provide a designated reader at home that's the older sibling that's the uncle or aunt it's mom or dad grandma grandpa Right, so you can do that in, in the face-to-face -face classroom. That's your model student. That's your teacher's assistant. That's your paraeducator should um, your student um, have a parent educator written in their IEP. Uh, present instructions orally. Again, with the use of smartphone and technology, you could do that. You can create screencasts, post them um, into your Google Classroom. You can, um, pull videos from, from YouTube and other resources that, that you, know, um, you have access to. Responses, we can allow for verbal responses. The parent can record the student responses and then send them to you. Um, if they're in the face-to-face -face classroom, then of course they can respond to you orally in the class. You can create, you can schedule a different time. Sometimes our students are not comfortable uh, participating in front of their typical peers and so you can have them uh, respond to their answers orally during recess or at the last five minutes. Um, creativity, it, you know, you can, you can exercise your creativity uh, when you're, when you're um, looking for responses or, or for the responses. You can allow for uh, the voice recording, you can permit responses to be given via the computer. Um, some of our, our new generation, not some, but all of our new generation students that are, that are coming up um, into the classroom, they are already technology proficient. You know, I have a, a three-year-old niece who can navigate her, her parents' smartphone better than I can. Um, and then permit answers to be recorded directly into the test or booklet. And, and that'll work for your hard copy uh, home learning option. So uh, scheduling, um, of course, we want to provide accommodations for, for assessments, again, because of the level of anxiety, because of the frustration that, that our students um, deal with. We can administer the tests over several time sessions over several days. So for the home learner uh, component, if they're not um, able to do the assessment, you can always schedule that assessment or at another, on another day or even at another time. And that also works with our face-to-face -face model of learning. Um, you, we don't, we're not bound to having the students um, participate and engage in their, in their assessments at the same time of their, as their typical peers. So some of our students, um, they, they take medication and some of the side effects for medication is 
for uh, is grogginess, is it's, it's to be drowsy. And so you can either administer this test on a different day, you can also administer this, this test at a different time that's opposite when the, when the medication is administered. You can give it to them before they take it, you can give it to them after, and they had time to rest. Okay. So other accommodations is timing. We can allow for frequent breaks. If we take a look at our student's admission, there was a level of frustration because of the amount of time the student was expected to submit their responses. Um, you can also uh, allow extended time for, for tasks. Now, one of the things that I want to really point out and, and impress upon you is that uh, with timing, it's not just like, you know, anything goes. If, if an assignment for your typical student, uh, for if the assignment for their completion is three days, double it for your student with, um, with a disability and give them six days. And so that way it's not, you know, we'll get to that assignment whenever we have time. No, there's still, there's still a deadline and a timeline for your submission. And we're, we're also accommodating you know, um, your processing time and, and the amount of time that it's going to take for you to, to complete your um, assignment, but it's not like this submitted at any time. Um, for setting, there's preferential seating in the classroom. Of course, that's in front of the chalkboard, next to the teacher, next to a model student at home. Um, it could be side by side, working alongside a parent, um, an older sibling, a grandparent, uncle or aunt. Um, preferential seating can also be in a area of the house that's conducive to learning. Um, and then also for um, special lighting and acoustics. And, and I wanna bring this back up for when we talk about our students on the autism spectrum. Um, provide space with minimal distractions if you know, your, your windows are wide open and it, it, the view is the, the neighbor's kids playing, maybe um, we might want to move this, the, the student or, you know, draw the curtains. And then also administer the test in a private room or alternative test site. Um, in, in, on the campus, that could be in, in the, you know, the, the main office, it could be in the counselor's office, it could be in the library. Um, and then, of course, at home, wherever the parent feels, you know, is, is the place that's most conducive. So the next, next disability, which um, is our second highest number of students receiving special education and related services, is our students on the autism spectrum. And um, some, some facts to note. Again, I do want to point out that this information was um, as of December 12th of 2019. Um, but with the statistical facts, that probably has not changed too much. But some of the things to know is that autism occurs in one out of every 59 live births. Um, autism is five times more prevalent in males than it is in females. So if we take a look at our, our local stats. For student receiving special education and related services with GDOE, we have 196 males and 45 females. And so... Um, Autism can be observed as early as the age of three, but typically for medical or educational diagnosis, that typically happens later. So there are some common characteristics of a student uh, with autism. And the thing to keep in mind is autism is a spectrum. So we have our, our more severe or, or lower functioning students on the spectrum. And this, then of course, we have our students who are higher functioning and um, at the other end of the spectrum. And so with autism, it's important to know that one, one size does not fit all here in the, with, with our students on the spectrum. But there are three areas um, of autism. Um, and this is their develop, their autism is a developmental disability. It um, significantly, significantly affects a student's verbal and nonverbal communication, as well as their social interaction and their behavior. There are some characteristics that are uh, common characteristics that are associated with students on the spe spectrum. There's the repetitive activities, um, this insistence of sameness, the same type of food, the same routine, the same personnel. Um, there's also um, resistance to change. So we may see 
um, some behavior uh, manifestations when the environment changes, even if it's slightly, um, and then also any changes in a student's daily routine. And there are all students on the spectrum. They also have unusual response, sensory responses. They're either hypersensitive to it or hyposensitive to it. Um, so some behavior characteristics, um, although every child with autism is different, there are several common behavior challenges, characteristics, some students display um, stereotypes or repetitive movements. This challenge can take the form of rocking, finger and hand, fl um, finger flicking, tapping, hand flapping um, of their hands and arms. Other challenges could be, again, the insistence of sameness that I've mentioned, and then also unusual sensory um, responses. So as I said, there are three areas and we've clumped the social and communication together because, you know, we, we feel that um, these, two, these, two, these two areas of deficits, they, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so there, um, a common challenge in this deficit is the lack of social emotional reciprocity. Uh, you may see this form of a student not being able to carry a conversation or the failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. Um, and then also there are deficits in their nonverbal and communicative behaviors uh, that's used in social interaction. So a prime example, and some of you may have already observed this, is um, a student on the spectrum's response can come off as being rude and very direct, but just know that our student on the spectrum has no clue that um, that they 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 actually said something that might be offensive, right? And so it's of course our job to just remind them of what the appropriate um, what the appropriate behavior response is and work with that work with the student. Accommodations to, for autism, again, I want, want everyone to keep in mind that this is not a one size fits all. Um, it's really a lot of trial and error. And, you know, allow, uh, take time to observe your student and, and take time to make notes of, of how their behavior um, manifests in the classroom or with activities or with any change of routine. And then we can think about what are some of the accommodations that we can put in place to help and assist the student navigate through the, the, the day. Um, so there is simplify work into smaller demands. Again, keeping, keeping in mind that our students on the spectrum, they have sensory issues so, uh, and sens sensory needs. And so, you know, if you're, if you're throwing everything and the kitchen sink at them, just expect that there's gonna be behavior issue, uh, behavior challenges that are gonna follow. Uh, avoid multiple sense, uh, senses working at the same time. Again, addressing their hyper or hypo sense um, reactions and, and sensory responses. Uh, prepare the child about upcoming changes. And again, depending on, on you know, the student's ability, um, our students who are on the lower end of the spectrum, you may need to use visual, uh, visual aids and cues. And then our students who are higher in the spectrum, that's a simple verbal reminder that happens prior to the change. Um, and then provide visual or written rather than auditory instructions. Uh, again, for sensory issues, if we notice that our students are putting their hands over their ears, then you know, we could use earplugs or headphones um, in the hallways and in the lunchrooms generally, wherever you know, it's loudest um, on the campus. And at home, of course, then it's, it's a matter of adjusting the, the volume of the TV or just not have the TV on when it's time to work. Um, provide warning and preparation when changes are anticipate, anticipated. Identify a quiet area where the student can take time out, um, can take time out to kind of regroup, and then use visual schedules and graphic organizers. So this is an, um, a video uh, that I wanna show you and it's, it's really, um, Carly is an actual uh, person with autism. And so I, it's just, it gives us a, a, a glimpse into um, a day as a, a person with autism. Stop sharing. 
Wait for a coffee. Oh, hello, barista. What do you girls want? Um, skin soy latte. <laughs> Tiernan, soy can't be skim. Hot chocolate, orange juice. No, Dad, I want a coffee. Hot chocolate? Great. So, I just think I'm going to Sarah's later. Could you give me a ride? Yeah, sure. Are you cool with taking your sister? Yeah. Wait. What? I have my own plan. Carly. Okay, I'll see you tonight, okay? Okay, so um, that was that was a video um, of Carly. Again, she's a person with autism. And if you um, watch during the video that she was given choices, and because, um, because of her disability, she has deficits with verbal communication, um, and she couldn't really, although she wanted that coffee, and I agree with you, Carly, we should totally get coffee all the time. Um, you know, she she could not she could not convey her needs and her wants. Um, but I will say that there, you know, with all students, again, it's a matter of finding that right accommodation. And so when Carly was put in front of a keyboard, she was she found her voice and was able to communicate with everybody via the keyboard. So um, so now we're going to. You sure? Yeah. One moment, I'm sorry. No, it's just fine. Okay. All right. So, um, Okay. Woo. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to pass um, the, the podium over to uh, Miss Christine Hernandez, who is an instructional coach, and she will go over um, the last um, disability, which is our students with other health impairments. So the view is going to get better. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Whew. For a second there, I was like sweating bullet. <laughs> All right, so um, like Ron said, we're going to go over the last um, disability that we're going to share this morning, and that is, hold on. It's always me, so just, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so the last one is uh, other health impairment or uh, OHI. So what's important to know is that other health impairment is a, an umbrella term that really encompasses hundreds of types of medical conditions. What's important to know is that what's central to, the, the, to all the disabilities that um, fall under OHI is that the child must have limited um, limited strength, vitality, or alertness, and that is all due to the um, to the to the chronic health impairment. And Ted, can you be here? There. Oops. All right, so we're going to go on to the next one. Hold on, sorry. So this is just kind of one of the things that you may encounter as you're doing um, distance learning again. So, <clears throat> uh, so anyway, going back, so they must have um, limited uh, strength, vitality, uh, and alertness. And again, it's due to the to the chronic health impairment, and that um, impairment actually impacts negatively impacts their their educational performance. So listed here are, are just a couple or a few common medical conditions that some of our students um, who are eligible for special education and related services of experience. And these are asthma, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, attention deficit disorder, epilepsy, diabetes, and lupus. So there's many more. So again, today we wanted to go over some accommodations for uh, other health impairment, again, specific to ADHD. And we wanted to focus on um, ADHD because ADHD is, is a pretty common um, condition that our students under OHI experience. Um, it's also important to note that many of these accommodations may be used um, throughout all three models of learning. So whether it be face-to-face, -face, whether it be um, online learning or hard copy. So accommodations targeting classroom environment. Um, one of them, if you notice, is flexible seating. So for instance, rather than, you know, if they're face-to-face, -face, rather than having them sit, if they need to stand, you can make them stand while they do their work. And that's the same thing at home too. Um, hard copy as well. So find a quiet space in the classroom um, or at home that has very little to no, no foot traffic and will just help minimize the distractions. It's very important also to, to make sure that parents also know that these are some of the accommodations that our students with ADHD can avail of. So, and be very clear when you're, when you're providing these accommodations or you're putting them in your lessons, be very clear as to what the expectations are so that there's no um, questions that parents will have. I try to alleviate all those questions that they may have. Um, again, a couple of a couple ways to help the student with their organizational skills, you can see on the, on the other side, is to maybe assign notebooks. Um, different color, you can color code the notebooks. Um, you can also provide extra set of copies of for books at home. So instead of having them, you know, carry it around if they're doing face to face, instead of having them carry it for, to school and back home, you can let, get, let them have a copy if there's uh, enough sets, have them a copy at home. Again, color code the material so that everything is color coded for each of the subject areas. Um, or you can even have uh, the notes sent home. You, you know, they don't have to take the notes. You can have the notes provided already, especially for those that are going to be doing the work at home. Okay. 
sometimes the mouse gets stuck and my heart starts beating. But <laughs> um, so when we look at accommodations for completing assignments, um, you, maybe you can try to minimize the number of questions or problems per worksheet. You know, just even typicals, right? If once they see this worksheet full of problems, already they start to panic because there's just a lot to do. So same with our students with, with ADHD. When, when there's just a lot, it becomes overwhelming. So try to minimize. And that, again, will work across all three uh, models of learning. Uh, you can also schedule frequent short quizzes or take a long uh, uh, one. Rather than one long test, you can kind of break it up into chunks. Again, make it more manageable for our students. You can also look at giving, I mean, grading for content and not the neatness of the of the work. Okay, so these are some things that unless you can go over them um, later. And then in terms of giving instructions, some accommodations to consider um, is to not only give the direction out loud, but also have it in writing. You know, especially if it's going to go home, have it in writing so that parents know exactly what to do. Parents and students know exactly what to do. And there's, and again, there's no confusion. Um, and then, or have them repeat what they, what you need them to, what you're asking them to do. You know, check for the, that quick understanding for them. Um, keep the, the instructions simple, clear, and concrete. Okay, and that again is throughout all three three models. Um, if your student needs visuals, use them, okay? A lot of times, you get the first couple of weeks, you're gonna to get to know your student. Um, talk to parents, again, talk to parents, and Debbie will go over a, a sample of that, but you know, talk to parents, find out, uh, especially if you're not gonna be able to see them face-to-face -face in that classroom. Get to know your students, but you know, you're, the best way is to, to talk to parents and, and see if they need these visuals, then give it, provide it. Um, another thing, one of the ways to manage behaviors, even at home, is to provide some concrete um, prizes or gifts for them. And again, it doesn't have to be something that's store-bought. It could be a pat on the, the shoulder um, at home. Parents can just, or even pass little notes and put it on the table and say, you're doing a great job. You know, our students, even those little things mean a lot because then now they know hey my teacher my mom and my dad is they're recognizing what i'm doing so i want to make sure that i continue it doesn't again it doesn't have to be something that uh you buy another thing that you can do to manage behavior is if parents are having some issues with behaviors at home because of the work is have that discussion with parents you know you can call you can email but have that discussion and see maybe there's something that we can do on our end to help minimize those behaviors. So this is an activity that we wanted to, actually it's a video that we wanted to share and um, I'll just show it to you real quick. Okay, put away your books. We're gonna play a game. In this game, we're gonna find homes for the animals. Listen to me carefully. In front of you are some animal cards and a grid. I'm gonna tell you where to move each animal card so every animal ends up in the right place on the grid. Are you ready? Everyone take the snake card. Now look at the grid. Put the snake card on the camel in the grid. Got it? Good. Now take the bird card and put it on the kangaroo in the grid. Dylan, are you with us? Okay. Now take the monkey. Put it on the I don't seat. have a monkey. Is that yours on the floor? <laughs> now no. find the kangaroo no. card. It belongs on the These mama's fun too, remember? Emma and Maddie, pay attention. <laughs> 
Dylan, are you with us? <laughs> what? Okay, now everyone, look at the octopus. Ew, weird. We're great. Now look for the elephant. Jacob and Sophia, please stop. <laughs> Put the elephant on the bird. I want you to place the rhino on top. Who saw of Dino? I saw rhinoceros at the zoo and I went with okay. my mom. Okay, put the monkey on the chest. Jaden, don't interrupt. I don't have any and then animals the left. On the Miss Saldano, my put game is missing a piece. Ready? Now flip your cards over. What do you see? Hold on, coming, coming back. What do you see? So you're gonna notice from that video, that's basically like your typical classroom, right? And so our students with, with ADHD, at one point you can, you'll notice that the teacher's voice just kind of drowned out in the background and all the student was hearing was all the classmates, the truck outside blowing its horn. And that's why we want, we, we ask, try to find a place that in the classroom or at home that provides a minimal distraction so that those things um, are not an issue. Okay, and again, this, all those things will ultimately affect the student's ability to focus and follow along the lesson, regardless if it's in the classroom face-to-face -face or at home. So, so, you know, now that we know so that these are some of the things that our students with ADHD experience. Now we need to focus and, and take a step back and say, okay, so what are some things that we can do to minimize those distractions, both in the classroom and face-to-face? -face? All right, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Debbie. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, I'm back. Here we go. So we're gonna talk about some um, general strategies um, that you can possibly use with the sug suggestions that we are giving today. Here we go. So some general strategies you'll see are listed down. There are four of them that uh, we put up here for you to consider as you prepare to teach with, as you know, your student with a disability. So many of the strategies are used in a resource room or on a daily basis. However, um, please know that these strategies may also be used when planning for students uh, who will be or may be assessing their education through an online or through a hard copy model, okay? So as you can see, the, the four strategies listed here are to communicate often and consistently with family, which is what Chris had mentioned earlier. Um, explicit instruction is another one, visual supports, and differentiated instruction. So starting off with communicating with your, 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 your parents, right, before developing and even considering a lesson plan, it is important that as teachers, we communicate with students and their families. A, a good first step to begin um, is with this uh, family support plan. And this family support plan was actually developed by our own Division of Special Education and was shared out with many, if you haven't already seen this already. Um, it is also um, on their website, on the special education website under our GDOE um, uh, website. So um, you can find it there, but this is especially helpful uh, to use if you have any, you know, a student um, that is assessing their education online or through hard copy. And the first thing you need to do is to be able to understand your child and your child's, or your student actually, and your student's needs at home and what it's like at home with, you know, um, um, in their household, what are schedules look like at home and stuff so that you can be better accommodate your student when you're actually planning. Um, it helps to tailor uh, the instruction for each student and it, it, it actually has some driving questions in there that can help you prepare for this child as you plan for them. Um, the next suggestion or recommendation is 
um, actually, I'm sorry, not the next one. Let me, let me talk to you first about a little bit more about communicating with the student and family. When you use that, when you communicate with your student and family, you're first going to start with the behavior plan. I mean, sorry, not the behavior plan, the family plan that we actually just did, uh, I showed you previously. Um, but here are some things that you may want to um, consider when you're communicating with your students and your families. Number one, make the personal connections with the family. Um, if they are unable to access video calls, maybe you might want to reach out to them by phone or by text if that's available. You might want to create and provide some training resources in the areas of communication and literacy to, for families to use, right? Give them that, that resource um, to use at home. Be sure to schedule regular meetings with the family. And this is so important because in these meetings, you need to dis you can discuss their progress. Um, you can check to see how they're doing with the learning and provide support at this time. And I believe this year they're giving us Fridays also to communicate with parents. Um, we won't be having students on Friday. So that, that's the time for us to reach out to our, our students and our families to uh, our parents to communicate. Number four is keep a log, you know, of each time you need to contact the family. I strongly suggest that you have those notes because you're going to be talking to many um, different families, many, many different parents, and you want to make sure, right, that you're documenting what you last spoke about, what you last supported them with, and how you can further support um, them. So be sure to keep notes of any resources um, that they may need or any follow-ups. Um, you. Number five, you may use language that can be uh, understood, or please use language that can be understood. Uh, try to avoid educational jargon because a lot of parents are teachers, of course, and they they don't uh, they may not understand our educational jargon. Try to make uh, your language simple and easy for them to understand, um, leaving little or very very little interpretation for for them on their own, right? Um, and if you're 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 the child needs an interpreter, please request for one through the department. If the family has access to watch videos, use, the, use this source. Um, videos, you can even um, um, video yourself as the teacher teaching your, you know, teaching your lesson and um, share it with your students so your students can actually keep reviewing it and, and keep accessing it later on. And um, you, you know, they can go back to the, the strategies you're modeling and be able to, to go through it as many times as they need. Um, ask them what are your child's current successes and challenges. Um, use this information to inform the next steps of your, of your uh, planning. And it is important to remind the family that it is okay if it is not perfect or if things do not get completed. Okay. So now I'm gonna move on to the next recommendation, which is explicit instruction. And explicit instruction is a highly effective instructional strategy. Um, it is a way to deliver direct, structured, actually structured instruction uh, for students. And this is good from students from kindergarten all the way up through high schoolers. It actually helps make lessons clearer and show students how to uh, start and then succeed at the task as they go through these explicit instructions. There are three um, sequential steps uh, for ins explicit instruction, and we're gonna quickly go through those three. Uh, those three steps are the modeling, guided or directed practice, and independent practice. So explicit instruction with modeling, um, this step consists of the teacher demonstrating a task for a student and describing exactly what is being done as it is as it is being done. So the goal of modeling this modeling step is for teachers to explicitly state the what, the why, the how, the when, and the where of what they are doing. Right, the information you are giving them. Um, it it you want to present this information in smaller units and then gradu you know, gradually go up in, in a sequence. And it's usually ranged from simple to uh, more complex, right? Um, so when we do this, range it from simple to more complex, we're actually addressing our um, students with learning disabilities needs, right? Um, the teacher can also use examples of, of what to do and what not to do, um, and directly maybe highlight some of the skills that are being um, taught to the student. Um, so explicit instruction will actually help um, 
highlight skills that the students are trying to learn or the teacher is trying to teach and it will help facilitate the students understanding or of the learning objectives of course we all start with that learning objectives right so for example let's say that we have little johnny and little johnny's goal for the week is to independently make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich so now i know that i'm going to implement explicit instruction right with, with johnny so um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to model it for him. As a teacher, I am going to um, make sure that I am verbalizing my thoughts out loud. So as I am modeling it, I'm actually verbalizing what I'm doing. Um, for example, we said we wanted to address in, in modeling the what, the why, the how, when, and here. So for the what, maybe I might say, what am I going to make? And I'm verbalizing this out loud as I'm teaching it to Johnny and I'm modeling. I'm going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And hmm, we are going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Why? Um, maybe to help me learn things in a sequential order. So I'm going to use a peanut butter and jelly, making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich help me learn that sequential order. Um, the how part of it, right? Maybe you might um, um, ask the question, how am I going to make this sandwich? I'm going to think out loud out as I do this this thought process okay so that um, Johnny can actually see what I'm doing and he can actually hear right and match what I'm saying to the actions I'm doing right and be able to tackle that task um, he can also hear my 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 thought process of me um, troubleshooting or actually um, uh, thinking out how am I going to to make this sandwich right and and showing I'm showing uh, Johnny how I can organize my thoughts right so maybe I might say out loud hmm what are some of the things that I may need to make my peanut butter and jelly sandwich oh yes maybe I might need bread I might need peanut butter I might need jelly um, a butter knife right because I don't need to spread that peanut butter and jelly on it on my bread and maybe yeah, I'll need a plate right and um, yes I must wash my hands especially at this time right before we do anything we must wash our hands so as you can see I'm kind of verbalizing my thoughts and going through a process so that little Johnny can understand what I'm doing so I'm explicitly stating what I'm going to do what my thoughts are and I'm going to model it all the way through so the first thing is I might say is okay I'm going to go wash my hands and actually go to the sink wash my hands show Johnny I'm doing that before I actually start my process and then of course you will go verbalize you will verbalize yourself step by step and give that step by step instructions on how to make that sandwich while modeling or showing Johnny how to make that sandwich um, and then the when and the where don't forget to tell Johnny we are going to make this peanut butter and jelly sandwich in class or here today in class maybe Johnny might be at home but here in class today right and we're going to know how to do this by the end of the week right so it's important to remember that at this step, the teacher is not asking uh, students the question. The teacher is actually verbalizing um, and answering the questions herself so that um, while they're demonstrating so that Johnny can actually hear that thought process. Okay, moving along um, to the guided practice or the direct practice of explicit instruction. After you model, the next step, of course, would be this. And um, it, this is, allow students to succeed while achieving the desired learning objective, right? This is the part where um, we're going to ask, we're going to uh, work together with Johnny and we're going to ask Johnny to do it uh, with us, right? So it's going to actually, this, this step is actually going to help students to gain the confidence and motivation that is necessary to continue their learning. So um, we're going to give Johnny that opportunity to try the task on their own um that was just modeled by us right um we're going to make, make sure that we give johnny the proper feedback as he is doing it and we're going to be watching him to see what steps right are, are going uh he's doing to make sure it's done in the correct step manner since that is our objective right um we want to actually verify and adjust and consolidate any deep, you know, any, any understanding, deepen his understanding of what learning is taking place at this time. So we are trying to connect that, that um, the, the learning with the objectives and with, with what already is in Johnny's long-term memory with what he may know about, about uh, making that sandwich. So at this point, we're guiding Johnny through, um, we're, we're 
helping him um, by giving him feedback, um, by watching um, all the way through, and of course, making that connection for Johnny. Um, now, if I'm going back to the example of making that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, this step will require the teacher to, of course, guide the students through. And the thought process will be verbalized, like I said, but now the students are asked, of course, the questions. And together with the, with the teacher, the student is answering and trying out that task. So this is actually that, that do part for, for um, the, the, your student. The third part of explicit instruction is the independent practice, right? And this is the, 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 the um, part where the students are going to actually be able to show their learning in the situation that you have just asked. So now they're going to show you that I can independently make that peanut butter and jelly sandwich myself, right? Um, it includes that opportunity, of course, like I said, for them to test out their understanding their knowledge and be able to show you and perform for you at the highest level of mastery that they can. Okay, so at this point again, um, um, Johnny may be able to make that peanut butter and jelly sandwich on his own, which would have met the uh, you know our 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 activity task. And in, in turn, of course, as the teacher um, um, views what Johnny is doing and how he does it and gives feedback, she can determine whether Johnny has met that objective of the sequential order. So that was explicit instruction. My mouse is sticking here. The next one we're gonna talk about is visual supports. And when implementing visual supports, make sure you have the student's attention before delivering an instruction or asking a question. Um, consider the, the, the uh, processing challenges um, and the timing that some students may have um, make sure that you, you have their, their attention, make sure that the pacing of, of what you're um, saying as you use the visual support um, is, is um, at a good pace for your student, right? Um, avoid complex and verbal directions when you're, when you're using visual supports, right? Um, you don't want to use too much of a com complex directions while you're using visual supports because your, your student may have a difficult time trying to focus on a visual yet at the same time uh, processing all your complex uh, directions. You want, give, you want to give directions that allow for inc um, incomplete language or for allow for complete language processing, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we min minimize things that are kind of negative, right? We don't want to use things like don't or stop, but maybe use things like please stay within, you know, um, for example, if they're outside on the sidewalk, um, or things, you know, you might be want to use more positive um, language. Um, you want to model and shape correct responses uh, to build their understanding when you're using the visual supports, right? So, um, for example, if you want to teach Johnny the meaning of stop, right? Uh, maybe if you're outside, you can hold Johnny's hand and you can actually walk or run together with Johnny and then say stop and stop with Johnny. So that Johnny understands stop means to be still, right? Don't move anymore. And then continue running with Johnny and say stop again until, and you can continue doing this with Johnny and then you can gradually actually fade out and see if Johnny can you do stop on his own, right? That's another, uh, another way you can use that visual support. Um, and then you can supplement v verbal information with pictures, right? Um, visual schedules, uh, gestures, visual examples, or written directions, okay? So the last one is differentiated instruction that we listed as, as a recommendation. When planning lessons, you know, you as teachers should think about what students should take away from their lessons. We always wanna make sure that they have that that takeaway, right? And see if, if, they, if they got what you wanted them to learn. Uh, once you determine what you want them to take away, you should then find ways in which you can make learning take place, right? Um, you wanna make sure that, that uh, children have different learning styles. So your teaching uh, practices should reflect just that. Um, by differentiating instruction, you recognize that students sometimes need more time or more than one way of showing of teaching than another. So we need a lot of different action, different practices for them to understand that lesson. So with differentiated instruction, as you can see on this uh, on the screen says it could take 
it could take place in, in many different ways, right? You can differentiate your, your instruction through visuals, through audio. And again, there's that, that example there. For example, you're teaching um, the three branches of government, a student who has a, a, um, uh, a disability, um, or as actually not at the level of reading at the, as the rest of your students, maybe that child can benefit from uh, providing, of course, leveled reading material or watching maybe a song on it. I mean, listening to a song on it or watching a video. That's an example. Okay, so with differentiated instruction, um, there are three um, approaches that vary. I mean, there are three differentiated areas that vary, right? And I'm sorry, four. The four differentiated areas are content, process, product, and the learning environment. Um, when you're when you're using differentiated instruction, you want to consider. Oops, sorry. These four areas: um, content. Talking when we're talking about content, we're talking about figuring out what a student needs to learn and which sources will help him to do so. So we gotta make sure that we know what that, that, that content is that we want. What do we want it to make sure that Johnny knows how to, but by the time he leaves here, right? Uh, processes, um, we wanna make sure that the activities help students make sense of what they're learning, that the activities are Apple actually applicable and support the, the objective. Um, the product is of course, the way the student's gonna show what they know. And of course, making sure that the learning environment feels safe or that they know that they can work together. Okay, this actually ends our um, portion on special education. We hope you've, I know it was a lot of information to obtain, a lot of information to process. Yes, the, the PowerPoints will be made available and this Zoom recording will be made available uh, to your um, principal so that you can um, uh, view it later if you need it to, to reference it. But without further ado, um, we were going to go on a two or three minute break uh, before we bring on English as a Second Language. I have Dr. Matilda Rivera that will, is here to present to you and uh, Felix Chaco also that is here to present to you the ESL portion. But I'm going to just ask you to take a really quick maybe two minute break, three minute break, just for you to stand up, stretch, maybe get a glass of water and uh, as we transition in and um, uh, into the ESL part, portion of our presentation. Okay, so I'll start now with that two or three minute break. We'll be back in three minutes.
It's done? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We will now move on to the ESL portion of our presentation, which stands for English as a Second Language. I'm Dr. Matilda Rivera, and together with Felix, we'll be presenting ESL. Okay. Okay. Don't you love that globe spinning? <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. It's Deb. Can we move this camera over to the, yeah, because it's, so we're just gonna move this little camera over. Good. Okay, that's good. Okay, and I serve as an ESL teacher and coordinator at Talapopo Elementary. Yay, Talapopo Elementary. So I know we have some teachers there online. And of course, um, you can see me there. I've been involved with ESL as a teacher and coordinator for over 20 years. Um, also, I was a regular classroom teacher for five years. And I am involved in many, uh, community volunteerism organizations from PIBA, which stands for Pacific Islands Bilingual Bicultural Association, the Guahan East and Famiguan Lions Club. I served as a former um, IRA president and uh, there are um, too many to list. Um, there's also the US Coast Guard Auxiliary and I think I'll stop for now, it might take a while. So we're gonna also look at um, Felix who, um, has served at Timuning Elementary for four years. He was a ESL teacher and coordinator at DW as well for 18 years. His hobbies include uh, photography, hunting, and hiking. So we have a diverse experience here. Now you see the ESL population there. Uh, according to the GDOE Annual State of the Public Education Report for school year 2018-2019, out of the 29,719 public school students, the ESL population made up 18,690 of the students. So that's quite a lot. So this indicates that English language learners make up 63% of the GDOE student population and this is increasingly evolving in addition out of the 24,244 students enrolled in the GDOE special programs ELLs or sometimes refer to them as ELs English learners make up 77 percent of those students so we um, of course have a challenge but we're here to ensure that our students needs are met we now move on to some characteristics and determination of the ESL eligibility. All parents or guardians must complete the HLS or what is known as the home language survey during the initial registration process. Now this one differentiates English speaking students from those who interact in another language and culture on a daily basis. ELs are determined to have come from linguistically and culturally diverse backgrounds. So if the parents or guardians indicate a yes response to any of the five questions on that HLS, the language assessment scale or the loss assessment is administered. An EL who comes from a home environment where a language other than English is spoken and scores at a non-proficient level on the loss test of three or below is identified as limited English proficient and is thereby entitled to the ESL services that our department um, provides. So the EL will not be placed in the ESL program without prior notification and consent from the parents or legal guardians. So that NOE or notice of eligibility must be signed. Moving on, we have our program options that we must complete as part of our services. The first one is our um, pullout, which is option one. Now this one combines students from several different classes for intensive English language instruction. Students should be grouped according to age, grade, English proficiency, or a combination. So the length and content of the classes depends on the school's total student population, the proficiency level of the students 
and the number of ESL teachers. Now, some schools are small. I may have only one ESL teacher who serves as the coordinator as well. Like, for instance, at my school, I'm at Talafofo, so I serve as both, so I have a dual role. So that's challenging, but we do um, our best to ensure we meet the needs of our English learners. The responsibility for the students' grades lies within the classroom teacher for this option. The ESL teacher provides supplementary support as part of the service. We do have option two. This one is the sheltered language arts classes for elementary. So we keep them in for a longer period in this option. It's also a direct service program and our ELs are um, provided appropriate modifications uh, to the regular curriculum to ensure that the material presented is comprehensible to the English learner. And we provide visuals and other strategies to ensure that this takes place. Moving on is our program option three, which is sheltered at the secondary level. And these are designed to teach the regular curriculum using sheltered English teaching strategies. In this one, the teachers are regular content area teachers who have received special training in appropriate teaching techniques for sheltered content classes. Many of them also use SIOP, which we will also share um, in a moment. Our next program option, option four, which is consultation, entails that there is the facilitation of communication and the opportunity for collaboration between the ESL coordinator or ESL teacher and the RCT, which of course is the regular classroom teacher. Now this ensures that instruction in the regular classroom is modified to meet the needs of the ELs. Students are mainstreamed in subject areas as English proficiency develops. Uh, we believe in the LRE, which is the least restricted environment, um, because if they can succeed in the regular classroom, the mainstream classroom, then we want them to, of course, be immersed in that. Now, students enrolled in these classes should be able to understand the content. The progress of the students must be monitored in all their classes until the students have completely exited the ESL program. And there are certain criteria before that can be done. You can refer to the ESL procedural manual for further details. And so th these are simple um, basics of what to expect within the ESL program and what we provide to ensure our English learners needs are met. Now, the next one is the program option five, which is the SPED program. When the IEP or the individualized education plan of a SPED lab student does not indicate a need for ESL services, the EL will be classified under this program type. ELs with IEPs who receive direct or indirect ESL service do not fall under program five, but rather under the appropriate ESL program that I had mentioned to you earlier, whether it's pull out, whether it's sheltered, whether it's consultation. So that would be that determination. Moving on to program option six is the follow-up. As part of this, um, we have the designation for students with the PW or parental waiver, or who have met all criteria for exit, um, MA or who are exempted from testing. Now, follow-up forms must be completed for two consecutive years for all students with um, ME or the exempt or, and as far as exiting as well, we need to ensure that the continual follow up is there for at least two years and all criteria have been met before that is done. We do have challenges and I'm sure you're aware of that where there exists a gap in academic achievement between the English learners and the native English speaking students. So some of you may or may not know that many of our ELs do need at least four to seven years to learn English before they reach average academic performance levels. English learners at the beginning, emerging and developing levels are not yet proficient in English and do require instructional support to be successful in their academic studies. Now, ELs at the beginning, emerging and developing levels also have not yet achieved proficiency as measured by the LOSS or the language assessment scale. And therefore we need to ensure we provide the support that they need. 
In doing so, there are ESL modifications and accommodations. I know that Ron, Chrissy, and Deb had shared many of those. So some of these um, are similar to that. So I won't really belabor too much on them, but you can see that you need to allow for breaks between tasks, allow extra time. Um, sometimes the teacher needs to be able to have the student next to him or her. We need to have a print rich environment, labeling objects around the room, and that uh, facilitates vocabulary at the same time. Visuals are essential. We heard about visual supports in our previous presentation, so you know how important it is. We need to provide a low anxiety learning environment so that they are comfortable and are capable of taking risks and um, are able to perform. Now, um, all assignments on the board should be printed as well, along with the visual support. Okay, you see a picture here of the class. They're not practice social distancing, but keep in mind that they haven't quite um, put many visuals there. So this is as close as we'll get to that, but you in your classroom will have to practice those CDC guidelines. Okay. So of course, materials are also part of that when we provide modifications and uh, accommodations. We need to adjust the work. I think uh, you heard from our previous presentation how sometimes you would even have to cut um, the uh, uh, vocabulary in half. If you have 10, then you can break it down to five and just keep in mind the objectives must still be met. As long as the objectives are met and they are capable of doing the work, then at least we know learning is taking place. So we need to ensure that the anxiety is lowered and we can do so by providing uh, these modifications and accommodations. Provide supplementary uh, materials as well to enhance the comprehension. Provide a summary. Um, manipulatives are so essential. So um, when you're learning math, just holding it in your hands and being able to touch it using your sensory mortars enable the students to be actively engaged and hands-on with the experience. Vocabulary listing, again, here's a re-emphasis of visuals, models, realia. So these are terms you've heard before, but because it's so important, we do have to repeat it in order for you to be mindful of it and then share it with others as well. Our lessons also have to be modified. Uh, and um, as part of this, you'll hear about the SIOP, which is Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. So we'll share a bit about that. Again, adjust the amount of work. You're not watering down the work. What you're doing is providing the necessary uh, support and you're still ensuring that objectives are met. Allow peer assistance, of course, with cooperative learning, we have to practice social distancing, but the students can still work together even if they're uh, at a distance. Um, we do need to ensure guided practice is there, hands-on activities because we learn best through hands-on approach, provide op opportunities to use language in pairs or small groups, um, repeat instructions if necessary, simplify instructions, state and post content and language objectives because of course the content area is there but the students also need to know the language of the content teach key vocabulary. Uh, that's essential because if they are unfamiliar with the vocabulary that is used within the content that you're teaching, they'll struggle. So ensure that they have at least the basic vocabulary necessary to do well in whatever activity you do have for them. Note-taking skills as well, graphic organizers, whether it be a Venn diagram, whether it be a teach chart, all of those can be used as part of your instruction. And of course, samples of complete at work because if you provide them with the sample then they'll be able to work towards that benchmark of what you expect them to complete. Assessment must be considered as well as part of this. You um, would allow for acceptance of student generated work, projects, timelines, models, portfolios, allow time to take the test or test in sections so that they're not overloaded and taking the test in such a long period of time will actually do more harm. So that's why we always mention chunks. Chunking is important. Allow note cards or open book uh, during the testing. 
allow students to retake the test. Of course, spelling is essential as well. So you'll have activities pertaining to that. Um, allow tests to be read orally. I believe I, I, I'm mentioning that again because we need to be able to use other forms of uh, testing um, while keeping in mind the objectives that need to be met. Alternative testing, study guides are important, reduce the number of test items, um, monitor grading scale, portfolios again are uh, so important with the visuals and then we can actually see the progress from the first quarter towards the end. And knowing that the uh, students are able to progress in such a fashion can be seen in their portfolio um, evidence. Rubric as a scoring tool is also um, essential. True and false, matching, fill in the blanks. It will be dependent upon your objectives. So those are uh, simple um, ways to go ahead and ensure that. Again, make sure you follow with your objectives uh, to meet the needs of your students. And we did mention earlier about the SIOP, which is the Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. And some of you have heard of that, um, but in ESL, we do know that it does effectively meet the needs of our kids through research-based studies. Um, it builds on the student's academic language proficiency in all content areas. It has eight components. There's the preparation, building background um, knowledge, comprehensible input, strategies, interaction, practice and application, because they need to be able to apply it, uh, lesson delivery, and of course, review and assessment to see what they have learned. Now, these components emphasize instructional practices and are highly effective in teaching our English learners. Here you see a visual of the SIOP 99 ideas and activities. I'll show you a moment with regards to the four corner strategy and you'll get a handout of these 99 ideas and activities. So that will be provided to you. Here is a SIOP lesson plan sample, which is inclusive of living things and the environment. You see that there are the objectives stated there, both the language um, objectives, the content objectives, key vocabulary, materials, uh, motivation. So all of the components I had mentioned um, earlier are inclusive of this lesson plan all the way to the review and assessment to ensure that learning is taking place. Now, if the objectives are not met, what do we do? Well, of course, we go back and we reteach because we know that we need to approach it a different way, right? So we don't stop there. We need to provide with a, whatever support is necessary in terms of meeting the needs of our kids. We do have lesson plan um, templates for you. So here's the first one pertaining uh, to that with regards to the eight components. We have yet another one here. So you see it displayed here. We'll also be providing these handouts to you. So you'll have a bell of it later. We have another one. This one is in landscape style. There are other strategies that we utilize for English learners. This one is the CITW, which is the classroom instruction that works. And as part of this, you have nine instructional strategies to improve the success of our ELs. The first one uh, is identifying similarities and differences. Secondly, summarizing and note-taking. The third, reinforcing an um, effort that is in providing recognition. Four, homework and practice. Five, non-linguistic representations. And Felix will be sharing uh, some of that when um, he does his presentation, cooperative learning. And we know how cooperative learning is so essential. I do know we're in a COVID-19 um, situation, so you can still do cooperative learning uh, from a part, as I mentioned earlier. It's just that you stay within six feet, but they can still face each other and talk to each other. So that cooperative learning still takes place. Uh, setting objectives and providing feedback, generating and testing hypotheses, and cues, questions, and advanced organizers. Again, I know these are some things that uh, were mentioned before, but that's how essential it is, and therefore it's emphasized once again. As I mentioned earlier, the Four Corners vocabulary, which includes a vocabulary word, illustration, a sentence, and definition. You see a sample there of lightning that includes each of those. And so there's the picture, 
There's the, the word lightning, the word in context, and then the definition of lightning. There's also the strategy of give one, get one. So in this one, uh, we have uh, giving one idea to a partner and then the other partner gives another back and you would record it on your sheet and you continue to repeat this process. Again, due to COVID-19, continue to practice social distancing. So the students can hold up their idea from wherever they are sitting and exchange with one another. Keep in mind that they also need to ask each other, well, why is that important? And why did you make uh, that connection, right? We need to ensure there's a connection um, that's taking place of what they are learning. There's also the squeepers, which is the SQP to RS. And, um, it tells, survey, question, predict, read, respond, and summarize. Again, this builds the background knowledge and um, as it applies to the new text the students are reading. For the survey, they would preview the text, questions, list one to three questions they think they'll find answers to, predict, um, state one to three things they think they will learn, read, read the text, respond, try to answer questions, modify, drop, add, and then summarize at the end of the text because they should be able to have learned something by then. We do have another uh, strategy. This is the KWHL chart, which is part of the graphic organizer. You're familiar with the KWL, um, but this one takes it a step further and adds the H of how I can learn more. So prior to the lesson, students record what they know what they want to find out, uh, how they can learn more, and then at the end, uh, they would record what they've learned. In this case, you see what I know, sharks eat meat, what I want to find out, which sharks eat people, how I can learn more, search the web, of course, that's uh, the popular one, and then what I have learned, tiger sharks are dangerous. Yes, they are. Okay. Of course, uh, for the ESL strategies, we want to ensure that um, students are read to daily. We can't emphasize how it important is for daily reading. So both hearing and seeing the written word daily will indeed help our ELs develop a better understanding of the English language. It's important to also select texts that are diverse and representative of different cultures. This will create opportunities for them to make connections to the text. I know they're not practicing social distancing here in your classroom. You would have to space them out. So we need to follow those CDC guidelines but making sure that learning is still taking place. Now, we also need to choose appropriate and engaging materials for our ELs. They need access to vocabulary, so select books that contain visuals, captivating storylines, plots that are predictable and have rep uh, repetitive phrases. It's also essential to use material that is both appropriate and interesting so that they stay actively engaged. And you see here a visual, um, this is the brown bear, brown bear. We know there's a lot of repetition in that. Great visuals for the kids. We have one student here using distance learning, using an, an iPad as part of uh, the story reading. So that's the ebook. And that was captivating for the English learner. As part of the strategies, you should talk, read, and sing together every day, so that's essential. Engage the students in conversation. Being able to do all of this will enable them to be actively engaged in the learning process. We do have online resources for you as well. Uh, Color in Colorado, that is, is a bilingual site for educators and families of English learners. You should check that out. Um, they have additional tips, strategies, books, uh, especially for ESL parents and children alike. We also have what's called the six essential strategies for teaching English language learners. And this one is at edutopia.org. So edutopia is a resource that many educators use. And they have a special one for our English learners. Uh, in particular, this one focuses on best practices. So 
check that out for additional ideas to meet the needs of your English learners. We also have the top five strategies to position English learners for success uh, this year. This provides the effective strategies to help them achieve that academic success. So additional tips for you so you can have a successful start. So we're here to support you and support our kids. We have English learner infographics. You'll see many visuals here. And uh, this one empowers our EOS with captivating visuals for instructional purposes. Just like with your project um, based learning, you'll come across something uh, similar with that. Now we have the NABI, which is the National Association for Bilingual Education. This one provides additional resources to address the needs of our ELs, the Sill of Biliteracy, OELA, or the Office of English Language Acquisition. There is the Learner Toolkit. And then for your students who have no English whatsoever or just uh, landed on the island and need to be able to develop that proficiency, we have the OELA Newcomer Toolkit. So that will be very essential for you. So check that out. Additional online ESL resources, TESOL blog, TESOL teaching English to speakers of other languages. Um, Judy Haynes is one of their popular TESOL uh, resource um, people. And uh, in regards to this, she has a special blog for you. You can access informa information that is on STEM, smaller class sizes, back to school strategy, scaffolding, all of that good stuff just to meet the needs of our kids. We also have the English Learners blog. And so here we have, uh, who's an ESL learner herself, uh, Valentina Gonzalez, who is able to provide additional instruction for English learners. Okay, so Felix is going to go ahead and introduce the English learners and distance learning. Yes, so welcome Felix. All righty, welcome, welcome. We're almost done, guys. Hang in there, hang in there. All right, well said, Dr. Dr. Tilda, Dr. Matilda. A lot of information. Um, so now um, we're just going to get into not so much we learn all about the uh, all the process that happens at the school level, and uh, I, we thought that we present that because throughout my years teaching, sometimes uh, the teachers have no idea when we say what program type and such. And of course, your school site coordinator will always uh, be willing to uh, present that. So we're just going to get into this real quick. Um, if I'm going too fast, just, just let me know. Uh, I, tend to, I tend to go fast. And um, I want to make sure that you know, we, we really understand what's, what's, what's going on here. So let's, let's take a look at this quiz, true and false. Um, it was supposed to be part of an activity, but the way we did this, uh, uh, it's going to take too much time. But so we just kind of go over it and uh, you can read it to yourself. I'll read some of the questions. I'm not going to go over it, but some of these questions uh, came up, you know, throughout my years in the class or also at the school at, at the school site. And um, if we look, really look at our learners, this is geared towards everyone, not just high school or middle school, you know, K to 12. Um, let's look at number one. Teaching English learners simply requires implementing good teaching strategies. I like to take a look at number two, specific language learning assessment is needed to assist English learners. So if, if you read, if you look at these questions, just kind of put in your head whether it's true or false. And then if we have time, we can go over this. This is actually part of uh, um, when we finally polish off these uh, these presentations, they'll be presented on you on, on on our website where you can actually take the quiz for yourself and, and see it. And, um, you know, these, these questions have always come up throughout the years and uh, they can really help you to, uh, to make these decisions for your, for your uh, ESL learners or your EL learners. The terms, don't get confused with them. Sometimes they'll say ESL learners, EL. Uh, to me, it really doesn't matter as long as we, uh, we know that uh, they have a, they need help with with language and not per se a, a learning uh, so so to speak okay so a couple major considerations with distance learning and our EOS our EO students um, we have to be familiar with their unique situation all the time and you know this is going back to the home 
Um, we, and we can't assume that just because they're EL students, they're low uh, in the social economic status, which is not always true. Um, I've had parents and guardians that came in and uh, they're, they're in the middle class, they work, their students actually have um, access and such. So we can't make that assumption. Uh, but then we can't make the assumption as well that that they're prepared. So, you know, we just have to really take the time to 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 find out this this information um, at at your given school site. Uh, their home situation, and to help them make that transition uh, that transition into a home or distance learning uh, type of environment. Um, based on what I've seen, we might have a couple of distance hard copy. Uh, which is not that difficult. You're just basically transferring into paper and then just really, you know, let's go back to the lesson planning, that portion for, for parental uh, uh, directions. That really has to be very specific and, and detailed, but simple enough for them to understand. And, you know, we're, we're going to work on, on making, you know, these common um, directions, uh, trying to translate it into the first language because that, that, that really helps. And, um, our current manual in our home language survey, there's a bunch of languages that were that were translated. So if we can do it for that, we can certainly do it for these lessons. You know, pick a, like a consortium of uh, of common directions, and you know we can translate it into the common languages, uh, which per, which predominantly come from the FSM, True, Panpin, and 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 so forth. And you know, manage the rigor and the workload. You know. Um, I know just don't forget, and this is going back to Deputy Sanchez saying, it's not just your class, you know, it's going to my secondary uh, 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 colleagues out there. They have five other classes. So just kind of manage that workload and that rigor. And, um, you know, if you know, and then here's a, here's a rule of thumb. If you really want to know what you're working with for your, your ASL students, just ask your coordinator for the last link's results. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that can be shared amongst, amongst teachers. So if you see they're, they're in level one, two, and three, then you know they might have more than likely they didn't do too well in the listening part or even the reading part. So if you really get that last link's result, you can really sort of start with a, with a, with a baseline and say, okay, I, I can't give too much writing um, or I can't give too much reading. That's not, that's not, that's, yes, it's within, high school or, 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 or um, middle school level, but it doesn't mean that they can handle it. So just be really mindful on the workload and, uh, and, and the rigor, but don't water it down, you know, make it meaningful. It's just that challenge to really that, that thin line between making it kindergarten versus something that's appropriate. So just, just keep mindful of that. Okay, parental involvement and culture of schooling. Um, this is parental involvement and, and all the ESL coordinators out there know, and even some of the teachers that parental involvement is, you know, is a big part of actually uh, the duties that you gotta keep up with. So, you know, question, uh, you, gotta, you gotta find out what, 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 what parents are, are into, you know. Um, so something to, con to consider is, you know, should parents be involved? That's an obvious question, of course. Should they be quietly supportive, you know, passive kind of? Should they be firm advocates for the perceived needs of their children? Um, you know, as, as teachers and educators, we're going to say yes to all of that. Um, but one thing to consider with parental involvement, it is important to understand that the teacher's expectations with education and instruction may not match the cult cultural norm of the student's family. And, you know, most of our parents, they really are in a position where there is really going to be tough for them because so so many years they depended on you guys you know you you see their 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 daughter or their son more than them in in in, in a sense so it's really just to really understand where where they're coming from you know really be compassionate with them and be more patient I know it's it's easier said than done, but um, it's just something that we we need to do at at at, at this moment. Um, and you know, some parents are going to be very hostile. <laughs> they might be hostile and say, "This is not my job. We're paying you to do this. Do this job. How come I have to do this?" Um, you you you're going to hear that. 
and my advice just you know always be professional and just say that we're here for your 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 child and um you know don't take it personally because they're they're as frustrated as 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 we are so the the questions to consider regarding uh the culture of schooling is uh you know is schooling considered competitive or or cooperative you can go and read this on your own and really one 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 thing I, I, I see here is um, our parents are accustomed to be involved in school and their children's activities. You know, these are all these are all burning questions that I've got from colleagues from off island, even here um, and even down to gender, you know, um, throughout my years of teaching uh, at the school site and uh, ESL, even in the high school, you know, gender plays a big part. Um, you know, female t teachers tend to have a hard time with um, with with some of our male students, and 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 quite the opposite for for males. Um, so that's 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 something to consider in our culture. And uh, you know, believe it or not, a lot of our Pacific cultures still practice that matrilineal side, where really the 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 matriarch of the family really uh, controls what's 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 going on. And you know, even even if our culture, you know. Um, the wife is uh, sixty percent, and the husband is forty percent. You know that that sort of thing. Women still uh, make a lot of a, a good decisions, so consider that too. Um, going through going through uh, all those years of conferences, you know, it's the mom speaking up and so forth, and I'm really concerned with uh, their child's activity. So, gender has a has. It's, it's kind of considered when it comes to uh, to learning in itself. So, yeah, we're not going to spend too much time on this. I really want to get into the, the activity. And um, I'm going to be just, when we start the activity, I'm going to be just picking an a email at random. And so if you have your computer and you know how to, to manipulate, you're only using one screen and so forth, uh, I'll be sending out the invite for the thing and hopefully we get it. If not, then that's, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just go through it because we, you know, we want to give time for uh, for the for the next uh, uh, presenter. So these these are our current practices. We're not going to go over it. Uh, Dr. Matilda went over SIOP, uh, touched a little bit of, of CITW. I put this out because you can take these strategies, uh, SIOP and so forth, the whole language, and even even direct instruction. You know, don't don't you hear DI? You're already freaking out. It's it's not as 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 what you're thinking. So you can always take these these current initiatives and um, you know use it. If you're a coordinator, you can help your RCT with it. If you're a sheltered teacher, you know you can certainly do this. Even even you can even do this uh, in a, in 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 a, a distance form because you know a lot of these uh, a lot of these um, our current initiatives, you know, they really are strong in face to face. So it's really our challenge to try to try to make these uh these initiatives uh distance and they're they're inherently good for it because a lot of these activities uh can be done through uh, uh um technology so so let's look at that here's a framework so you know the side basically is a umbrella of different frameworks this is just one of them and we see technology as part of it and also cooperative learning so we really look at at these different uh, uh, frameworks, and we can, um, you know, we can, um, we can, we can say that 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 let's say you want to incorporate cooperative learning and technology. You know, that's all well possible, and we have Jamboard here and um, and and our Google Meets. So we'll, we'll go ahead and go through the slide first um, because you know I don't want to get where the computer freezes or anything like that. You know, and those are the kind of things that will frustrate you if you're, if you're doing this, but just kind of go through the motion and then um, not wing it, but uh, just have a just have a backup plan for that. And you know, the problem that, well, well one issue that a lot of our teachers were, were bringing up is, you know, my computer's old and such, but just know that if you have a mobile device, uh, these things work pretty well. They're just hard harder to navigate on your smaller screen. If you're using the iPad, it might be, better than you know using your phone and such and but i've tested it and it is possible and believe it or not your students that are adept to this that are that have this sort of access to these to these mobile devices um 
they actually have a better interface uh, with this than even the, the computer because you know the mobile device uh, is, is very uh, popular with our students. So we'll go ahead and go through the slides step by step. Okay, so Google Meet and Jamboard, they really work well together. Um, so let's go to the step. So step one, we got to open up the Google Meet application. All right, just please note that you may need the most recent Chrome browser. I think uh, Internet Explorer works, for, but for some reason, Edge, Microsoft Edge doesn't work too well. I don't know, maybe they're in some kind of war together. They don't like each other for some reason. <laughs> Step two, you open up the Jamboard application and start a new Jamboard. Okay, if you have an existing one, go ahead and use that. Step three, we click on the present button. And then step four, select Jamboard under Chrome tab, then click share. So I got screenshots coming up for it. And then step five, click share and enter all or just one of your students' GDO email or even your, 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 your fellow colleague. So, you know, if you look at the icon here, uh, we go back to the waffle. You know, if you were there for the Google Classroom and the, and the Google Meets uh, with Frankie and, and, and his crew, uh, the nine dots, the waffle. And then you're gonna see this. Uh, you can scroll on the bottom a little bit. Oh, and then just click on it. Then you're gonna see click join meeting. Okay, the screenshots. Hopefully you can see that out there in the internet land. All right. And um, after that, you can write the meeting code or you can write the name of the meeting in this screen right here. And oh yeah, by the way, if you if you can multitask in your computer, you're you're more than welcome to follow along. But we'll we'll go ahead and try uh, some activities out. And then don't freak out when you see your camera. It doesn't mean you join. You got to join first. I mean, you got to present. You can you can join and then present your screen at the same time, or you can just click on present so you can get the Jamboard ready. So you you click on that present there, right? And then you can open up a tab or a window. If you're gonna run a video from a site or something like that, uh, use the Chrome tab, because for some reason it runs smoother on that than to share just a window. Uh, if you have the video, if you, if you wanna share some kind of video or something like that, uh, it's best to download that video on your computer so it stores on your hard drive and it'll, it'll, it'll run smoother. So once you select from this screen right here, oh, where's the mouse? Uh, go ahead and just click OK, or just click click it and click Share. You see it on the Share button, and we'll we'll go over it after these screenshots, you know, step by step. And you know you're good, you're successful when you see sharing this tab to meet.google.com. So you know you're 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 in there already. And then you go from there. These are all links. Okay, we'll go back to that. So let's go go ahead and go back to the other slides here. And we'll see if you see this work. So first, we open up our Google Meets. Okay, I will put this screen where we can see it. All right. Okay, transfer screen. Okay, can anybody can everybody see that screen? You guys see the screen? No, okay, we're gonna share this screen one more time. We have to do a reshare. Okay, we'll stop sharing. We'll share the Jamboard screen, which is coming up right here. Share. Can anybody see the Jamboard screen? Yeah. All right, we are in. So we just really simple. Click and join a meeting. Uh, we just put Jamboard. Uh, you can also put a meeting code here if you wanted to. More secure. Okay, click on this. Hold on, let me get my mouse real quick. Hold on. All right. Oh no, you have no port. Oh, yes, you do. Right here. Yeah. Right, right now we have a mouse, mouse. Okay, so you can go here, don't worry about the camera, you can turn it on if you want to, it's fine, don't worry. 
Okay, turn it off. So we'll click on present right here. And you notice I don't have, I don't have a Jamboard selection. So what you do is before you do that, we'll go ahead and go to, no, not that. We'll go to open up the Jamboard right here. Okay, open up the Jamboard real quick. So I'm gonna make sure that I open up on this on my tab. So we'll go ahead, can everybody see that right now? Oh. So this is the kind of issue if you're using somebody else's computer, uh, that's what you gotta be mindful of is that sometimes it won't open up right away because it's signed on to a different computer as you can see right here. So we'll go ahead and open up your, your Gmail. So that way, okay, we're not gonna show Ms. Deborah's email right now because it's confidential, but go ahead and click on this on the waffle and you see in the bottom here, Kind of scroll down a little bit, scroll down, and then now we have Jamboard right there. So we'll go ahead and close off. We'll go ahead and close this off right here. Sorry, I'm looking up because uh, we're looking at a big screen here. <laughs> we'll go ahead and leave this right now. So, yes. No, not yet, not yet, not yet. I will, I will, I will. No, not the coat, just the, just the Jamboard. Yeah, we're gonna be, I'm gonna send not the meat, just the Jamboard. Okay, where's the mouse? There's the mouse, the mouse is going all over the place. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna pre click on present now. Now you see the Jamboard right there in the tab. So we'll go ahead and share that. So now I'm sharing on the meet the Jamboard. So anyone, so anyone that joins, um, I can have and see. Now we see that we has we haven't created one because this is not my computer. <laughs> this belongs to Deborah. <laughs> so we're gonna create one. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to create one. So I'm looking up. Make sure I'm looking up that you don't see any uh, boogers on my nose. Am I clear? All right, I think I'm clear. Okay, so here you can title. You can you can title it if you want to. Just call it. Uh, jammers right on whatever you want it's up to you uh just going back to uh going back to digital uh citizenship you know that's something you want to promote in your class you will probably have some training on that in the future you know let's make sure students don't put anything you know that's not 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 appropriate so i mean this is a really simple you, you can have fun event i mean when when it first got when it when it first entered our G Suite, I was mess playing around with it so much, and you know you want to go old school, do the black background right there. But make sure you change your pen to the white because uh, black on black you're not going to see it, right? Right. So I'm looking through this little ring light here, so right here like this. I can see it over here, and it's kind of a little wonky, but. If you look at it, you can see, and I'm with the mouse. If you have a touchscreen computer, this is where Jamboard shines. So take advantage of your touchscreen computer. Even the iPad, I tested it last night on, on uh, my girl's iPad, and it's really good. I invited her to my Jamboard, and you know, and, and she was able to get on. And just one thing about that, let me pick an email here, and hopefully, if you can check your email, I'm gonna go for, let me check in the chat here. Where's the chat, there we go. Let me see you an email here. Attendees, there you are. Oh no, not that one. Not that one, where's the chat? Oh, here we go, the chat's hiding. It's hiding on your computer, Deborah. Okay, so I'm gonna just pick an email here. And if you can check it, uh, let's go for, let's go see. Uh, okay, Crystal Castro, if you're out there, if you're listening, 
hopefully not in the restroom or washing your dishes. I'm going to add to uh, invite you to this uh, Jamboard session. Hopefully you, there we go, there you are, you're there. All right, I hope this is you. I need, you know, put a little message. You know, you can say welcome to our Jam board session. Oh, it's okay. It's a little squiggly line there. It's okay. It's not really a word. So I'm gonna send it. So now, as an editor, you're able to you're able to access this Jamboard, and you can actually use this, and you can go separate. See how he says person added. So I added that person. Hopefully, that person responds to it. So you can have separate Jamboards for each student. And if you want them to present something to you, or you want to present something for them, you can use this certainly. Um, so let's. So while we're waiting for our volunteer or our volunteer, uh, we're going to clear the frame here. And here you can actually go 100%. So your screen gets bigger. So depending on what kind of a device you have, if you have a Promethean board uh, and you're working with your distance online in your classroom because you're a minister, so you have to teach all three and you're pulling your hair out, this is where you can really zoom in. You can go as much as 200% if you wanted to and really take advantage of the entire board right there. Um, and you know, a lot, of questions, a lot of people ask me, can we type on this? Well, it's not really meant for text typing, but this is your kind of like your drawback. So what you can do for each Jamboard, you can name, you can say this is your student's Jamboard. So if Crystal comes in, then we'll say, let's make sure I spell your name right now. Did I spell your name right? And Crystal's board. You know, so what, so this is, this is sort of like a, like um, a way to add some text into it. Okay, and we'll go and cancel that. And you can, it's really big right now, but you can resize it if you wanted to. Okay, so the arrows there. So you can resize it, you can make it bigger and so forth. And then, you know, the backgrounds are pretty cool. This one's goes for, if you're teaching math. Let's go ahead and lower down the, fit there you're teaching math you can use the grid grid frame um, we have a little frame of dots you can all your art, art teachers out there you can be you can be really creative with this this here and then we have the traditional line where students can actually write um, something if you, and, and, and like I said if you have if you have um, a touch screen this is where it really shines. You know, I'm gonna attempt to sign my name. Yeah, our pen, you know, you got a stylus. Oh my God, I don't even know how to do cursive anymore. Do you still teach cursive? I think I already forgot already. Let me see, Fan, if I can do cursive with a mouse like this, you know. So let's see. Oh, here we go. All right, Crystal. Now, Crystal, if you can hear me, can you, can you control or write anything on a Jamboard. Let's go see. Because sometimes, sometimes it's it's really laggy. Sometimes it's kind of wonky, but but we'll see. So if you're out there, can you actually write something on this? And just remember, you're sharing the first Jamboard uh, because you can go separate and share another one with another student and so forth. So you can go back and forth. So. Hopefully you can, I don't know, Crystal, if you can, if you're out there, if you can write something, say hi. Oh, there she is. There she is. You can tell because you can see her little icon there. She looks like she's trying to write with her mouse, <laughs> which is which is a difficult task, but very good. So as you can see, it really, it, it's really wonderful because you can, you can share it with your students or then your, 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 your colleagues and uh, you know, you can present something. And the only the only issue is 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 there is going to be a lag, um, but as as this distance learning continues, these companies are really in the position to uh, to strengthen or to harden their 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 applications. So they're going to be competing with each other. So yes, Crystal says hi. Very good. I'm going to say hi back to Crystal. I'm using the mouse again. 
and looks like I'm writing in my left hand and I don't know how to write, right? So at this point, you know, Dr. Matilda went back to four corners. This is a perfect place. So we're going to clear the frame here. And it also clears out crystals uh, uh, high. Very good crystal. Uh, this is pretty cool to brush. So art teachers out there and so forth that you really want to show your skills off. You go to the clear background here. And you really can you know, do a lot of stuff here. So I'm going to attempt to draw a laddie stone. See right here like this. Kind of put it shady. And once again, going back, if you have a touch screen computer um, and you have a stylus or even your finger, this, this program really, really shines. So as you can see, it does work with, the, um, with sharing with your students. And once again, you can share individual Jamboards. Uh, there is a way for them to, to do two Jamboards in a way where I'm still, I'm still really researching it. And I'm pretty sure some of our colleagues out there are already a professional in this. So, you know, I encourage you guys out there that are really good at this at your school site, you know, share it with your colleagues. You know, the more experts we have on this, the, the, the more people that are willing to, you know, we can really cover a lot of teachers um, and so forth. And, you know, we can really help parents too. Um, there is a way you can share with your parents too. So, you're, you know, your parents can be involved there too. You know, they have their own jam board. They'll be having fun with their, their student and so forth. And, you know, this pretty much guys, the sky's the limit. You just got to really think outside the box and really be creative with, with our, with our, our uh, technology. Um, and, you know, we've been finding new ways to, uh, in, to use our, our G Suite. Uh, Frankie, a colleague of ours, we, he was able to uh, do a Google Meet in the Zoom. And yesterday uh, we had did the Google Meet and I shared the, the content that Frankie was sharing because one of our teachers, uh, uh, his interpreter, um, you know, he's deaf and hard of hearing. So he was able to, to see the captions and, and, and all that. And because we still haven't worked out the kinks for the Zoom captions, I, I know it is possible, but I was looking at it. And, um, and then again, you can present your slides if you want, but you know, not everyone wants to see captions. So we, we kind of made it reserved for, and we had that accommodation for our, our, so you can, you can, you can Google meet in the zoom and you can zoom in the Google meet. It's, it's really, it's, it's mind blowing what, what, what we can do just with the screen sharing properties and, and, and all of that. So I really wanted to just, to just get into that. And, um, you know, uh, this this presentation is going to be available for you. So the screenshots really help and the steps to 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 get into it. And, um, you know, just just be mindful when you're when you're uh, opening up your tabs and stuff, make sure everything is open. I recommend closing unnecessary tabs. So, you know, everything goes smooth. And, um, you know, if your students are suffering from bandwidth, don't hold that against them because sometimes um, um, these applications can take up a lot of resources in terms of uh, their, their bandwidth, you know, not everybody has uh, 50 megabytes per second or 200, you know, like that, you know, not, not everyone has that kind of connection. So just, just be mindful of that there too. And, you know, for face-to-face -face teachers, if you have enough laptops in your, in your current school site, go ahead and open up a Google Classroom, start a Google Meet, start a Jamboard, even there in face-to-face. -face. And now you're in a position, in a better position to help, to, to help your students because you're there. Um, it's easier. So just because you're teaching face to face, it doesn't mean you can't use technology incorporate this because in case anything happens in case we shut down again, uh, they'll, they'll have some sort of, of way to, to continue. And also it, it, it makes it consistent for you. Um, you know, you're, you're not, you're not bouncing back. Like, okay, I got to break out my face to face gear. Uh, oh no, I got to break out my online, my distance online gear and, and, and so forth. You really just keep it consistent. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of computers coming in and there's an average of what 30 30 devices per cart so if you're half half the size with your face-to-face -face classes you're going to have enough uh, uh you know computers to go around and if you don't have a, a new computer yet you can certainly use one of the students computers you know log in there and you guys can go in the classroom now you're probably saying well what if we shut down they can't take it home yes we're not in the position but um, we're hoping that we can keep the schools open and, and so forth for our students to, to, to use this. And if they do have a computer or even an iPad, or like I said, your phone, um, you know, you could still, you can still incorporate these, these, these activities. 
So, you know, don't, don't assume that, uh, that just because they're ESL students and so forth, it doesn't mean they don't have access, but we're going to always try to provide that for them. So yeah, thank you, Crystal, for that. Um, we've got to kind of move on here for the next part because, um, yeah, yeah, we've got about 30 minutes and we want to give our, uh, I want to give my dear, uh, my dear friend, all right, um, a time to present uh, on gate. And so this, this part right here, don't, yeah, I can, I can share it with you later. This is not really the official, this is not the, this is not the official, it's the, the last end of the slide. Okay, let's go and close this off. We'll get out of here right now. Okay, so this part right here, uh, this is not the official, this is just uh, my personal, for, for my personal, um, um, or not, you know, for, for, for data collection. So this is not the, the one that's gonna be counted, you know, you always gotta do the, the, the eval link if you're getting this for credit. Um, and if you're wondering what that photo is, that's a yes, that's a photo of, um, of uh, Paseo. And you can tell it was right after uh, uh, the little, what was that? I already forgot what was the name of that. <laughs> best pack, best pack, it was best pack right here. This is a little drone shot. I do that um, on the side and so forth. But you know, thank you for, uh, for hanging in there. Um, I wish we could spend so much time on the Jamboard and the Google Meets and all of that, but, um, you know. But the follow-up sessions will have more advanced training and, and, and so forth. And then I'm pretty sure that once you get used to it, just get into the application, start messing around with it. Don't worry about making mistakes and you'll be good to go. All right, thank you. Let's take a little break. Uh, and we're going to give, um, we're going to give uh, Mr. Ernest a chance to... Uh, and, and or first Maridel yeah. to uh, to get positioned because she is at her school site and she'll be presenting on uh, project base. All right, Maridel, go get them. Off a day. Are we going to give them a break or just continue on? Just give you the Okay, everyone, welcome Matt. I know that was a short brain break, but we do have about 30 more minutes with you guys and we still wanna present our gate portion. Um, like Felix said, we have Ms. Meridale Paris who's presenting from her school site um, and um, uh, with, she's on with us right now. So we're gonna give her the floor and after Meridale, we're also going to have our infamous Mr. Ernest also present. So this is the gifted and talented uh, education part of our presentation. Our presenters um, today again are Meridale Perez and she's a gate teacher over at MAU Joe Elementary School. You'll see her there on your screen. Um, we're also gonna hear from Ernest, um, our gate theater teacher, um, here with our curriculum and instruction division. And um, we also had input on our, our the information we're gonna give you from uh, on gate from Davina to Manda, who's also our school program consultant with curriculum instruction division here at DOE. So without further ado, I wanna give our floor to Ms. Meridale Perez. 
All right, half a day. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Dell. I'm over here at Ujoa Elementary School. Mary Dell, in my classroom. Are you unmuted? Yes, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Thumbs up? Yes? Okay. All right, so um, again, I'm Mary Dell at Ujoa. I've been a gate teacher for uh, quite a while already. Um, what I'm presenting today about project-based learning, uh, my disclaimer before I start is I'm not an expert at this. I'm just sharing some information that I've uh, researched through the years and some activities um, of some way that you can use this project-based learning in this new time of teaching. Okay. So as you know, uh, we can move the slide. Um, Deb. Can we go ahead and move the slide? Okay. And again, I apologize if I'm going to be rushing a little bit. It's just time constraint. And, you know, I want to also give Ernest a chance to get online before everyone has to log off. So again, project-based learning is not new. It's been with us for quite a while already, um, ever since uh, 1987 when the Buck Institute for Education dedicated its um, efforts to improve 21st century teaching and learning throughout the world by creating and disseminating products, practices, and knowledge for effective project-based learning. So as you all know, project-based learning is a, is a learning experience that allows students to practice skills such as problem solving, critical thinking, time management. And all of these skills we learn in GATE, well, actually, they already know. In GATE, we just help them to improve it and to hone it to make it better. And PBL also allows for deeper meaning and understanding of concepts as they learn by doing. We know um, as learners, not only as teachers, but as learners as well, that if once we engage ourselves into hands-on learning, and if it's from our own, um, it's from our own, uh, how do you say that? Well, okay, so we learn by doing, definitely. And when it comes from us, we want what we think we want to learn will make more efforts to learn it better. Okay, so um, I do have a short video for you. Um, if it's able to play. If not, we can go ahead and just go on to the next slide. And again, as Dr. Rivera said, Edutopia, one of the best websites to go on for resources and learning materials. Today, we're going to start a new project. Teachers and their students have been doing projects since forever. Three, two, one, more and more are doing project-based learning. So what's the difference? That's a great question. Let's start off by reviewing. Yeah. Projects are typically limited in scope and duration. They're a good way for students to work with content they've already learned. Flip to the paper that says sundial. In project-based learning, students learn through the project. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. They address a real-world problem, a driving question, one that can't be Googled and has no single right answer. We were talking about how can we prepare for Atlanta's change in weather. Students have voice and choice in PBL, some input into how they'll answer the driving question. Does anybody think they might have some ideas? So they gain ownership of their learning. So those questions led to our investigation. They collaborate in a process of sustained inquiry, lasting more than a few days. We've got a whole lot of work to do. They reflect on their learning through discussions, formative assessments, and critiques of their peers' work. We are going to take a look at one of your friends' work today. And then revise their work based on those reflections. The final product is shared with an audience beyond the classroom. Maybe that's professionals in a related field. I appreciated how thoughtfully you responded. Or it could be the kids in the class next door. When students spend an hour exploring the four forces of flight by crafting a Mars lander out of paper, 
that's a project. When they spend a month simulating a Mars landing, analyzing the math and physics at work, and discussing their work with real aerospace engineers. And it sounds like you've done a little bit of testing to see if that works. Yeah. That's project-based learning. Capiche? Capiche. Research shows that rigorous PBL can result in higher engagement and deeper content knowledge. Keep it up, okay? Learn more about project-based learning at edutopia.org. Okay, so that was just a quick video about what project-based learning is. So all of us in our classrooms have probably already given up projects, which of course, as a teacher, it only has one common goal. In a project-based learning setting, um, there is no right or wrong answers. The students work on these questions, these probing questions, these probing activities to um, find the unknown. So it's a lot of um, student-oriented um, work. And for the teachers, um, for the teachers, they're there to be as facilitators. So if we can go to the next slide. And again, so um, with project-based learning, it's, this is gonna, it could be one of a great idea to use, especially now that we have students that are gonna be in the classroom as well and as well for distant learning. Um, it doesn't have to be done only in the class. So when we assign project-based learning, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna keep on going through my slides. Okay. So the project-based learning, again, it helps students as it piques their interest. When students learn about what they want to learn about, they stay engaged. It gives them ownership of what they want to learn and how they learn, of course, help the teachers help facilitate that route to make sure that they're not doing things that are not appropriate and just keep them in focus to what their driving question was. Again, it's also project-based learning is also student paced. Um, you give them an amount of, you don't give them the whole entire year or unless you really need to, but you give them a timeline. So it helps them with their time management and themselves. And again, for students on exploration for them, so they won't feel in, they won't feel bad if they're not getting the right, if they're not doing it the right way. Okay, so um, we can go to the next slide, Miss Debbie. For teachers using utilizing project-based learning, one pro of this is you can cover multiple standards at once. So one topic, there's many different standards that you can incorporate, especially with writing, with math, definitely science, social studies. Um, depending on what their topic is, Teachers can find that way to make it a teachable moment and insert those standards or have them focus on how to write or, of course, um, you share so you there's writing skills in there. Whatever their project might be, you can have them explore math uh, problems with that. So again, you can cover multiple standards. Teachers are there to be the facilitators this time. You don't instruct them on this is how you're doing it. This is how, the, how it's supposed to go because, again, this is the student's work. You just facilitate to them that, okay, maybe you give them options or you give them, um, you give them guidelines of how they're supposed to be working to make sure that they use their time effectively. Um, they can work on their own, you know, or in small groups. Uh, this will work definitely with um, home learning because they're gonna be by themselves. Uh, they, can, they can use this assignment at home. Um, Multi-level grouping, if you were in a regular classroom, you can group the students together. And again, um, they don't just have to be the same grade. Sometimes little kids learn a lot more from their own peers that are a little bit older or the older children, um, their eyes get open with the way the little kids think. So something that um, you can do. And again, if, of course, it reinforces the 21st century skills. I'm nervous here, so I'm going really fast. And if I stumble, just let me know. Okay, so the next slide just shows some, um, a lot of tips that, you know, when you, when you engage students in PBL, definitely uh, they become all these things and more. And that's one thing that we encourage in GATE is to improve that higher order thinking skills 
and this is the time that they can do it. Not, but also not only in gate class. So if, if you're in a regular class and you have that extra time or the kids have that extra time that they're, they finish their, your classroom work early, you can, they can, um, you can give them time to work on their own PBL in the classroom. Give them a corner that they can work on this. And again, so if it's student, if it's student based, student paced, they, you know, they won't be interrupting the rest of your lessons for if you need to work on the other children. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. How to, how to instruct your PBL. So the design elements of PBL definitely, um, it's almost similar to the scientific process or to the engineering design process. They come up with a question or a problem. One thing about PBL is a lot of these are uh, real life based. So they think about their environment, especially now everyone's being environmentally concerned um, about, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, what's, what's been in history, something new, okay? So they come up with a question or a problem, usually real life inspired. It could be inquiry based or interest based. The students research on their own for their background information, but of course, teachers can also facilitate with that. Again, it provides for authenticity. It's student generated, so every project will be unique. It gives them their own voice and their own choice, definitely ownership of learning. It provides them time to reflect and give self-assessment or take peer assessment as well. And then from that um, critiques and revisions, that's when they reorganize their thoughts or if they need to make minor, um, make adjustments to their project or maybe they forgot about something that wasn't um, thought of before. So it gives them time to uh, revise and um, improve their project. And of course, the one most important thing about project-based learning is the sharing. We always um, give the students an opportunity to share what they have learned, whether it might not be what you exactly expected, but this is how the kids think and this is how the kids work. And when they share, it gives them sense of um, pride because this is what they did. They worked really hard on it. And knowing that there's nothing, there's no wrong or right in project-based learning, they won't feel, um, there's no way for them to feel bad um, if they think that it was wrong or right, okay? So we can go on to the next uh, slide. So again, you know, you brainstorm, uh, think of what you wanna get out of the project, what are the solutions, outline your steps to achieve that goal, research, tinker, test, retest, and of course share. So I'm just gonna give you an example of one PBL that I'm going to try to in Incorp uh, implement in my classroom this year. It's, um, do I miss that? The next slide. So my real world problem would be, uh, what can we do to protect ourselves during this pandemic? Which I'm sure if I start brainstorming, a lot of the kids might come up with this question. I won't exactly, you know, this is the only question that they can work on, but um, one idea. So if I was the student, I'll say, um, I'll do a mask mania project where I'm doing this because it's mandatory to wear masks in school or we're in, when we're in public. My problems are the masks sometimes are too tight, they're too loose, they're too hot. We can't see the mouth when we're presenting. Uh, there's not nice designs, it looks ugly, it's always covering the whole face. So what could I do? So I would think of um, my, my uh, possible solutions, then I'll gather my materials, if um, I really wanna make it a challenge for my students, I'll give them parameters. I'll say, okay, maybe you only have this material that you found. You don't have tape, you don't have scissors. You only found leaves or you only found a piece of cloth. How could you continue on with your project? Okay. Um, so then we begin to plan, you know, they come up with their design, their details, their aesthetics, what are the functions of their mask. So a lot of these are critical thinking and of course, improving their creativity. The students start making their projects. Um, they test it, does it work? If it doesn't work, they redo it again. Um, they, get, uh, they get critiques from their peers or their family or the teachers. They modify, they test it again, of course. And then the most important part is they share, okay? So again, um, practically all, almost all of my students might be in distant learning. So how could I do that? Um, I will give them the PBL elements as a guide. 
we can brainstorm together through Zoom or through Google Meet, or if they're hard copies, you know, they can write it down, send it to me, email. Then I'll work with the student, we'll work together to create their timeline. You know, the students will make it out because they can't have the whole time that they're at home for one year just to do one project. Um, we check in at points, so we'll call them up, we'll Google Meet with them, okay, how's your progress? What have you done so far? The students can send pictures or make little uh, blogs, which, you know, they're better than me at that, making their TikTok videos. So they can do that as well. And then when they're done, they can present it in a variety of ways um, through paper format. They can make their own uh, little YouTube clip. So again, it gives them a lot of options and a lot of different ways to um, improve their learning, especially their 21st century skills. Okay, so the next slide will just show you some other, um, well, the three main websites that um, have lots of great information on project-based learning which is the PBLU, PBL Works, Edutopia. Okay, so um, aside from project-based learning, another thing that you can work on with your um, higher order, I mean, with your advanced learners is make makerspaces or makerspace kits. Um, another idea that you can do is just put a bunch of materials in a bin or a paper bag and say, okay, um, what can you do with this? What can you make with it? Or again, give them that problem solving, that project based question, okay? Uh, make something that will help the environment. Um, it again helps to uh, emphasize your engineering design process, uh, definitely the scientific method, all these things to help the 21st century skills. Um, for the GATE students, you know, we do a lot of these activities to help them, um, to keep them engaged in their class. I know I went so fast, but I'm looking at the time because I still want Ernest to present. If there's any other questions or um, uh, stuff that you guys have, you can always just contact us. Thanks, Debbie. Ernest, it's yours. Okay, okay. thank you, Maridel. Uh, we're gonna give you guys just one quick uh, minute to take a real quick break while I transition Ernest in here at um, our site here. Okay. Okay, everyone, we are back and we have Ernest Ochocho. He's going to be talking a little bit more about GATE and GATE and, and, and how GATE is used in the high school. Ernest? Hi, everyone. This is Hi, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to share screen with you. And I will show you my slides that I worked so hard on. Okay, here we go. Took me hours and hours. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to open up this thing. I'm from Gate Theater. Is that good? Yes, yay. All right. 
So I am with Gate Theater uh, Secondary Education and uh, with, a, with a focus on high school, right? So some of you are familiar with our program and uh, some of you are not. So first and foremost, uh, what you, we're gonna work through our objectives here for my little presentation. It's for a, uh, school year 2020-2021. And I'm going to, there, you move. There, oh, I, yeah, wow, it's moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so not tech, you guys, but you know, it's actually working. I was like, wow. It's very, very surprising to me. Okay, here we go. Now, uh, this is one of the shows that we did and we're gonna do our objectives here. This was Cinderella. Those guys are not Cinderella. They're just dancing for her. <laughs> okay, so our objectives are uh, understand more about the Gate VPA Visual Performing Arts Theater Program. Understand how the Gate VPA Theater Program provides learning opportunities for secondary education and diverse learners. Obviously, we're all about diverse learning, right? Understand how GATE VPA theater program will continue during school year 2020, 2021. Let me go ahead and clarify what VPA means. It is visual performing arts. Um, it uh, covers painting and drawing. It co covers dance, band, music, and of course, theater. And uh, theater is probably the most complicated out of all of the different uh, gate VPA um, departments because we're, we encompass all of the arts put together in one, including uh, literary arts. What is gate secondary education? <clears throat> so I do mostly the theater portion, but I also manage the, um, the VPA section, the entire VPA section. And uh, Gate Theater promotes creativity, self-motivation, self-discipline, and confidence to students in public and private non-public schools. And I, I wanna kind of touch on each portion here a little bit. The first one being, uh, you know, that's kind of like an antiseptic way of explaining what the arts do for people, right? So there's, there, there's the IQ, which is uh, intelligence quotient, and then there's also the EI, which is emotional intelligence. And we need kind of both of those things to operate as a real human being in the real world, right? You can be as, as knowledgeable about uh, whatever math or uh, business as you want, but if you don't know how to be a decent human being, then what's the use, right? You're just taking over the world and, and, uh, and creating uh, horror for the world if you don't have that emotional intelligence. And that's where uh, the importance of the arts comes in. The arts is there so that we can have emotional intelligence. We can learn how to be empathic. We can learn how to be, just like what, what Maridol was saying, uh, empathy, kindness, courage, uh, faith, belief, hope. All of these things are what the arts also encourage on an emotional level. Uh, we, we become more civil, we become more courteous, we learn how to cooperate with each other in a more effective way when we have emotional intelligence, right? Who doesn't want to have a kind kid or who doesn't want to have a kind coworker? I have a lot here in this room. <laughs> There's always food here. They're so kind. You guys have great emotional intelligence here. <laughs> you must be watching my shows. <laughs> so that's kind of where we come in, right? We, we learn to express ourselves. It also helps with uh, mental health, depression, all of these things, which is pretty, you know, pretty, it's, tr it's really stressful right now. And uh, the arts and gate, the GATE program is very important to have as a component uh, in regular non-COVID life, but also especially during times of crisis like this. Um, and we also assist non private non-public schools, which means uh, anything that falls under the Title V grant, which is, which is all of the uh, private schools pretty much, and also the public schools with the exception of Dodea, they have a different, um, they have a different program uh, or sorry, they have a different grant. Did I need something? Oh, no, that's, that's Deb, they're doing stuff. <laughs> and uh, also GCC and GOG. So we've got um, all of those schools under the Title V, which makes, makes, it, um, makes it 
very, very nice for me in many ways, but also makes it complicated for me because I have a lot of people in the shows. Over 200 usually are participating in our shows, right? Through technical, all of that stuff. Um, uh, technical uh, departments, uh, front of house, um, account, you know, it's just, it's, there's a lot. Um, community outreach, of course, the performance aspect of it. So there, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of people. And it's great. It's great. I love creating community that way. Uh, students are also provided the opportunity to showcase their talents and maximize their creativity. Yes, we want creative people, people who think out of the box, right? So there's a lot of problem solving. It's, uh, it's project-based learning, just like what Maridel had uh, discussed. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of creativity in involved and a lot of learning how to solve things on their own. Uh, sessions are held after school and impact approximately around what I said, right? Around 82. It's around 200, really. Um, that's including the band and uh, the dancers, et cetera, et cetera. The gate teachers provide instruction to high ability students in the areas of visual arts, theater, music, and dance. Now, I want to address that. When it says high ability, that's true. We want people who can sing, dance, and act, and perform, and, and, uh, and do all of that stuff, right? But we also want to be able to, uh, in my program, in, in the theater program, we also have different types of, of jobs, like I had mentioned a little bit earlier, where we can kind of use the abilities of the students to, and match it to, the, to whatever activity it is that's part of the theatrical entertainment process and have them be able to do whatever it is that they need to do at their level and at their comfort level, right? So, so um, I wanna say that even though we say high ability students on online. We also accept students who have, uh, who are diverse learners, right? ESL, uh, who have autism. I've had a lot of students like that. In fact, I have a student who sings beautifully. She's so, so good. She sounds like an angel. And she's on the autism spe spectrum, right? I was like, hey girl, you sound so pretty like me. Just kidding. <laughs> it's true though. <laughs> Wow, I'm just hair flipping myself. Okay, moving on, right? I'll make it as fast as possible because I know we only have a few minutes left, like five minutes. Connecting with students. How do we connect with students? Uh, this year, uh, SY 2020, 2021, teaching will be face-to-face. -face. We have uh, most, most of the VPA programs will be face-to-face. -face. Uh, we will have the ABC, ABC sessions uh, as stated by our um, administration. Eight to 12 students per session, a six feet social distancing, masks to be utilized appropriately. Um, Moving on, and I'll talk about masks later. Sanitation measures before, during, and after class. Students will be learning six feet apart or more because Dalai, when we sing, you know, it's very loud and there's a lot of air flying out of our mouth, right? So we want to make sure that uh, we're very cognizant of, of how much uh, space we're going to need uh, between each student and between us as teachers. Sets will be created for backdrops. That's under Mr. Chido Santos. Uh, students, Chido Santos, he is the one of the technical parts of, of Gate Theater. There's usually three of us. Well, it takes like about 10 of us, but you know, there's three. <laughs> we shoulder a lot. Students will be recorded and performances will be uploaded to GDOE's Gate website and social media. We do have social media. It's face on Facebook. It's Guam Gate Theater, GGT. Guam Gate Theater. It's also on Instagram, so um, make sure you check us out there. I will be posting a lot more stuff there. In fact, uh, my Gate students and I worked uh, during the summer. We worked throughout the summer, and uh, we put together some songs so, uh, for Little Shop of Horrors, which might be postponed till April, obviously. Anyway, um, I hope all of you guys, once the vaccine is out and everything is safe, you guys come and watch. Okay, so, but we do have social media platforms where you can watch all of our performances for this year. Skills, stagecraft. <clears throat> Mr. Chido Santos is in charge of this portion, construction, carpentry, safety, painting, and design. So there are different things like, for example, um, I can build stuff, but I'm also very good at painting. So sometimes when I go to help Chido Santos, I do a lot of the stippling work, the you know painting work and things like that. It's very creative and very fun. And sometimes our students also are tasked to create props. One of, my, one of our students was tasked to create a galleon, a ship, 
like a ship that could hold maybe about 12 or 13 people on it. And we rolled that on stage and it was an actual ship with a mast and sails and everything. This was for the Little Mermaid. So we did that. We created a large elephant for Aladdin to, to ride on and you could put probably around three people on that elephant on top safely. And then we also had like a huge stallion, a horse for Mulan. So, you know, lots of different things and people were collaboratively working on these projects. So it's, it's very cooperative. It's very project-based learning. It's very, very effective, right? Um, there's one of the sets that's for Cinderella. That's Alyssa. She's one of my students and uh, she was Cinderella and that's, Paul, one of my students, also my nephew, and he was the prince. And we have generational, and I wanted to let you know that we have, we, we, we have multi-generational um, learners. We also have family that comes in. So sometimes the grandparents, the parents, the uncles and aunts, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, they're all a part of the show. So it's very family oriented. Uh, we connect on many, many different levels for gate theater. So it's, it's super, super cool. All right, um, here's some of the other sets that Shrek and then Beauty and the Beast. Here's one of our shows and it's Cinderella. And this is when um, Cinderella transforms into the magic dress. And that's also the magic uh, no, carriage. That's the pumpkin, as you can see on the top, right? So, and the kids helped with the horses there and she's gonna spin she's gonna spin and that dress is gonna transform into a gown. Oh my God. Everyone wants that at their wedding. I want that, or maybe just me. I just want that at my wedding. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I wanna transform. <laughs> okay, and I want it to transform into a $10 billion. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so that's part of it. There, she made a joke about Divisoria because you know, we all go there to buy stuff, right? <laughs> and then, um, so we're gonna move for farther and she's singing, she's singing. Do you have time? Sorry, what's our time? We're a little bit past 11. Okay, we're a little bit past 11, so I'm gonna move forward. And here, I'd like you to hear the last part of their singing, which is cool. She's an alum, she's the, alum. the um, Fair Godmother's alumni. That's Clarissa, one of my students. Yay. Hopefully you guys can hear what's going on. And there we go. So that's a uh, part of what we do in, and I wanna move forward beyond this. How do I get past this now? Past the video. Okay, I'm gonna stop the video. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint now. Oh, let me let me move farther along in PowerPoint. I apologize. Okay. Let me go ahead and share that. Share screen. Wow. Hey. So the next slide here is, talks about the thing, the different things. This is just very, just tip of the iceberg. Acting, uh, we use sensory exercises, um, uh, image, uh, Imaging, sensory memory, sense memory, Stanislavski's acting method, Stella Adler, we talk about that, Uta Hocken, different acting coaches that I've studied throughout my years. Singing, I also studied um, opera, uh, private lessons, uh, classical voice for many, many years, almost 10 years. And um, so I help also with teaching the kids how to sing how to sing properly. Dancing, Mr. Cesar Medina does that. I'm not very good at dancing. I'm only good at cha-cha at the party, <laughs> when I'm partying. <laughs> kidding, I can dance a little bit. Uh, tech, uh, Mr. Cheeto Santos, and Mr. we also hired Jams Media, licensed sound, board operating, floor management, stage management, and um, I'm also involved in all of those things in every aspect of it. 
Okay, moving on. We have this. This is the recent Mamma Mia. And I wanted to let you guys know that um, uh, we did the dance here. You know, it was so much fun. Here, we'll just listen to it because it's fun. <laughs> I give you a nice brain break during my presentation. So here we go. We actually taught the schools and we taught, um, can you guys hear it? Not the video. You have to share the video. My auntie calls it video. You have to capture and share the video. Okay, I have to actually share the video. But that, but I just want to let you know that um, this was something where we included the entire island uh, and the schools and anyone who in, was involved. We put on social media on KUAM on all forms of media platforms, including the Post and um, uh, and uh, PDN and everybody else. Uh, Twitter, all of that. We sent it out everywhere. We sent out a dance so that the, the audience could do a flash mob during the show. So it's very inclusive. It's very, um, it's very innovative. And it was really fun to have all of the, uh, the, the, uh, the audience members uh, create a symbiotic effect with our performers. So here, I wanted to go to the next slide. Uh, how to connect with us. So. You know, we want to make sure that we serve our students very well. And uh, the program that I have in theater and secondary, we accept elementary all the way up to high school and college. Um, and also we have teachers that uh, uh, come and join us. And like I said, family members. So we want it to be, we want everyone to be able to connect with us um, and be a part of the learning process, right? In some way, shape or form. We're gonna do a lot of online stuff now. So there's like graphics and things like that, that people can, can uh, participate in. But, but how to connect with us. GDOE curriculum and instruction, 671-300-1547. They can call us there or they can call my personal phone number, 487-3767. Uh, yeah, I give my personal phone number because it's been out in the public anyway. So everybody already knows it. So yeah, I get weird calls, but that's okay. <laughs> I can handle myself. Social media, Instagram, Guam Gate Theater again, FB Guam Gate Theater. So you guys can totally, totally connect with us on many different, in many different ways. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I wanna talk about PBS University before I leave. PBS University is another resource that you can use as a teacher. I'm in charge of the, the project along with my co-lead, Mr. Frank uh, Condazzo Jr. And um, PBS University, if you haven't heard about it, is uh, something that we did during the closing of the school when we had that couple of months left of school and we created lesson plans that were available on TV. And it's since been shared uh, in different parts of the nation. Uh, PBS, PBS National decided that, wow, we're doing such a great job with it. They're gonna use it in their programming. I was like, hey, down, that's cool. And so we're also going uh, international um, so other countries like Palau are going to also are also interested in integrating PBS University lessons in their um, in their educational system, and we're going to continue with that. Um, I'm in talks with Mr. Joe Sanchez right now to find more teachers to be involved throughout the school year, um, and in fact, we have our meeting tomorrow. Yeah, to 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 talk about that more with PBS uh, GM Ina Carrillo. So I would love to give you that heads up. You can use it. It's called PBS University. It's on YouTube and it's there uh, ad infinitum. You can use you can use it whenever you want. And we will be having more. Mr. Algarito and I are also going to work on creating an index so that you can find out which lessons are for which weeks, and you can use that in your own classroom as well for resources. And then we're also gonna continue with that throughout the year. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Broadway, Broadway, oh, there. <laughs> okay. okay, bye. All right, everyone, so that actually concludes our presentation for Working with Diverse Learners. I, hope, I know there was a lot of information that was given today and uh, that can be used as you plan for your one of your three or not all three you have to do all three but hopefully just one of the three um, models of learning um, if you have any other questions um, we will also be having um, 
uh, a question and answer session on Monday, August 10th. Uh, prior to you leaving this, please, there's going to be an evaluation link that's gonna be posted on the chat. Please click on that link and take the evaluation so we can get your feedback. We really want your feedback. Um, thank you again for your time today and um, have a safe and happy year. Bye.